love that you said she's like Sea Biscuit. <laughs> She was at the time. She was like, she was a sea champagne. She is a thoroughbred. She didn't need to do wet hot. She was like sea biscuit. She was really good. She like was like in like big movies with like she was a big big movie star. Yeah, sea biscuit's a big movie star. There's not many films that are named after the actor playing it. Sea biscuit's a huge movie star. Hello. Hello. How are you? I mean, yeah. listen. I've been better. Right. Right. It's a very, yeah. a very difficult, fraught time for so many people. Um, and so, obviously, we're starting off the podcast by just sending love out to everyone who is, well, A, directly affected by what is happening in the Middle East. I have so many friends who have family there. Yeah, uh, I have friends who have children there right now. So sending love to all of our friends who are affected in that way. And also just to everyone who is like feeling it. It's, it's a really heavy feeling to just be watching these atrocities taking place. Well, and, you know, it doesn't, I mean, it probably doesn't need to be even said, but online discourse can get really upsetting as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, I've had a really rough many days. Um, It feels so weird though, too. Like I had therapy, today's Tuesday, guys. I had therapy yesterday and my therapist and I actually, because last week, I don't know, the schedule was weird. So we had, I had had therapy on Thursday, I guess. But when we talked, I was like, wait, so how long ago did we talk? And then she looked and she was like, oh, it was Thursday. And I'm like, no, that's not possible. That can't be possible. It felt like a year, like a, a week right. had gone by. Right. In, and it had only been a few days. It had only been a few days. Yeah. And um, yeah. And, you know, we talk a lot on this podcast with you guys about, sorry, I'm already crying, just tr- trying so hard to be able to hold two things at once, which is clearly so hard for so many fucking people. Right. And also, as technology gets better and social media gets more ingrained in our every fiber of our beings having to watch in real time like just horrendous war play out. I mean, like, st- I- I'm thinking about Ukraine as well. Right. And when those first images of horrendous devastation came came out like our brains aren't meant to process this kind of to to witness this tra- like it, we're just not you know it's right. trauma like right. to, and so we're all like it's a collective trauma right but then there's the reaction to the trauma which is so different for different people in right. different ways, right. depending on their own. Well, I mean, any, I mean, any number of things, right? You right. know. And yeah, I had to. I stop. Like I on. I had to like turn. I had to. I couldn't be really online. I think, but because I was just, I couldn't like handle. I, I actually just couldn't handle the imagery like i couldn't see the things happening that yeah 
people have been posting. And and I know that part of it is like people are like, you have to bear witness to these things. And I I don't, I actually, I don't know. I don't know. I actually just don't know. I, I don't know about that. Yeah. I for understand some people. the sentiment to want to, but here's the thing. It, I, I think that you know what you believe, and I don't know that that's going to be changed by you watching, like, a detailed, in real time atrocity occurring. You know what I mean? I don't know that no. that's going to make you understand any better or any, you, Do you know. know and, I mean, can I be can I be quite honest with you? And I, look, the, the, <laughs> my kid is. She's like, this is this online stuff is making me so uncomfortable. Why can't? Yeah, is the Israeli government and the occupation is fucked. It's fucked. Hamas is a terrorist organization. Right. That's fucked. Right. These are innocent people on both sides. <laughs> like, and like, I just feel like. The part, the disconnect for me is when people are like, yeah, but. Right. There's no. no it's not a have, sports match. It's not a, it's not a sport. It's just not. And like, regardless of whatever. So fucking. I, I'm actually just fucking sick of like men. I mean, if I'm going to be totally. Well, I was going to say, like, when we're talking about like how there are victims of oppression in both places that are at war through no fault of the people who are being most heavily affected by it in this moment. You know that we are talking about the same people who are victimized in these attacks, like so many women, so many children. And that's who always fucking loses in war that is started by men, men. right? Yeah. Also, <laughs> I just, like, you know, last week, obviously, I've just been having a really fucking hard, it just feels like um, that everybody wants to, like, <laughs> fucking fight. And I feel like, yeah, talk about women and children losing. I mean, it's horrifying. Fucking war is horrifying. And I, I just, I don't know. And I think also a lot of, you know, what has happened in this country, our country, what continues to happen in our country is also fucking horrifying. And I've been trying to, like, you know, show up and continue to, like, in the ways that I can. And I did a, I did a bunch of events last week for voting for Virginia, for Swing Left. And, like, I did a panel for the 92nd Street Y about reproductive justice. And, like, ugh, it's men, guys. It's fucking men. <laughs> yeah. It's I'm sorry. It's not, and, like, by the way, fucking ha not, hashtag not all men. Fine. <laughs> but it is like, yeah, and then and then women who are making themselves complicit, particularly in the United States, because we, because women do have it better than in other places of the world, and one of the things that women are sometimes free to do is make themselves complicit in crazy retrograde, horrible. Well, yeah, because they you, they don't want to because they don't want to jeopardize their position. Exactly, exactly. I do just want to give a shout out because here's the thing, like I think that a lot of us have had the luxury of you know, not only in our own country being able to sort of just bump along and get along and and have it pretty good and really only open our eyes to to certain things when it really affects us and you know and and I think people have ignored when things are, were affecting them and and hopefully we're all getting better about that we're all just being more aware but with this 
really old conflict that's been going on for years and years historically in in the Middle East. Um, it's it's really something that a lot of people they don't know a lot about it. They haven't paid close attention to it because it's so far away, and particularly if you're not. Jewish or Palestinian, if you don't have family in Israel, I just I just think a lot of people have have sort of just thought of it as something that's happening very far away. And so I just want to send especially so much love to people who have been getting online and giving really nuanced education, people with firsthand experience. I just shared something this morning that my friend Ayala Waldman, who's a genius writer who I love. Ayala um, is literally a genius. Yeah, she's wonderful, and I just love her so much. And she shared something this morning that was so educational. And she's going through this. She was born in, in Israel and has many loved ones there. And so in that moment to be able to like put her writer and educator hat on to, to sort of explain things to, to lay people that, that don't really know what's going on. I just really admired the courage and the strength. And she gave a really nuanced take that explained much more than I feel like you can just get from headlines. Also, Rabbi Sharon Browse from Temple Ekar, who's been a guest on the podcast, has been posting really just, she's posting to sort of like soothe people's souls. And she's talking to obviously her temple, but it's also been really educational and helpful. And I certainly um, have friends that have family in Palestine who have been been doing the same thing. And I just really appreciate that in this moment, um, people who yeah, are- I mean- who are I, living it are going to the trouble to educate all of us on it. Well, right. I mean, but also, like, unfortunately, as we know, with Black activists in this country, with women who have had abortions right. or women who have been denied abortion care, putting their lives at risk, being forced to carry dead babies to term in the last two um, two years, mm-hmm. Um the onus is almost always on those going through it right. in order like, to educate others. That is just right. what it is. And it's really difficult. And, and thank also, God for and thank God they like people step up and do it, right? Right. Because because for every person that appreciates it, like me and you and all of you listening. There's somebody else coming in the comments to abuse that person because they disagree oh, with their I mean, I can't even like This was like, people are, you know, look, the anti-Semitism that's like rampant in our country, that's rampant everywhere, is fucking horrifying. And as the mother of Jewish children, like, make no mistake, like, they get put, they get taken. It it doesn't fucking matter. Well, it doesn't even matter, right? I mean... it does it didn't matter on the day of those attacks they they weren't specifically figuring out who was who they just attacked everyone so it it wouldn't even matter whether someone's practicing or culturally jewish or religiously yeah. jewish it didn't matter to them on that day it is terrorism it was terrorism i don't know casey it's just fucking enough i know I know. Also, like, to, I don't know, man. Like, yeah. Like, even in my com- comments, like, people are like, why haven't you been posting about, f- first of all, this is like the whole, to me, this is like where we're at in a con- as a country. Just like, mind your own fucking, <laughs> like, not mind your own fucking business, but like, everyone thinks that they have a right to tell everyone else what they're doing wrong. And it's like, look. Right. I'm not a bitch who can't take a constructive criticism. Do you know what I mean? Ever. From people that I, like, trust and know and who have been following the fucking journey and in good faith. Yeah, you're here to learn. I would hope that, I mean, I know that everybody who knows me knows that. But it is so 
truly like indicative of the bigger issue, I think, in terms of talking about or trying to solve any, any thing in, in our current like culture and climate, which is that there's no space, like people have no space for yeah. others experience, personal experience. And I have been trying to keep in mind, I think you posted something really, you shared something really useful about what we have to do to make sure that we're doing okay seeing all of this, which I know seems wild when people are right there, like on the streets there, and it's happening to them, like to be like, oh, am I okay? Like, like my phone is hurting me or whatever. Uh, but the truth is, like, it is affecting us all emotionally, just consuming it from afar, which I think once you realize that, then it puts into perspective, like, what people that are really there must be going through and how difficult it must be. Um, but I just, I have been trying to keep in mind that people that are making those comments are very hurt, obviously. I think some people are just evil and trolls, but I have seen a lot of commentary from people who are closely involved uh, either way in this situation. And I feel like they're very hurt. And so all I can do is like hear what they're saying and try to understand that like they're fucking terrified. Like that, you know, terror is the mission for some people in this world. And like, so when it's effective and people are terrified, like, all I can do is is hear them, but it's really difficult. And I just, it's wild because usually my timeline is fairly curated. I don't want to say it's an echo chamber because that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to learn and trying to gather perspectives. But usually everybody's kind of like on the same page. Everybody that I know is kind of on the same page, but people have been all over the place, not just about this, but about so many things. And it's just a really difficult time, um, you know, like when someone that you really like is like posting about how RFK <laughs> Jr. has like some good points or whatever, you know, like that's, that's a weird moment, you know, and you're just like, oh, shit, <laughs> shit, shit. Yeah. But, you know. Here's one thing I do want to say, and I've seen this over and over again. You know the people in your life better than anyone, but I have seen a lot of people saying the silence is deafening, that they haven't heard from anyone. And then a lot of people are responding saying, I just don't know what to say. And then those people that are complaining that the silence is deafening, they're, for the most part, I'm seeing them say they would just like to hear some words of support, which I know can feel fairly empty. Sometimes we worry that it's like performative if we're making these big proclamations and these big statements on social media or whatever, we feel like it's performative. And I agree that sometimes it is, but I'm just saying, you know the people in your life. Hopefully you know them well enough to be able to reach out and just say, like, I'm just checking in on you and I'm just sending you love and you don't owe me anything and you don't need to respond. I'm just letting you know that I'm thinking about you and that I'm here and I'm listening and... Hopefully that will be received well. I've been trying to do that on an individual basis with people that I'm in direct contact with, starting with people that I know have friends and family that are over there and, you know, just moving through my friend list. Um, but a word makes a difference. And I get it. I get being afraid to fuck up, you know, I get it. Um, as someone who has both feared fucking up and who has actually fucked up, like, I get that fear. But I don't, I guess in this case, I don't think that you can let your minor fear about fucking up outweigh the very intense and real fear that some people are going through right now. That's a bigger fear. And and if you feel like you can speak to it with people who are in your life, like, it's it's a good time to do that. 
I think that's really smart, Casey. Always. I always think what you say is smart. <sighs> it's hard. I've been... Oh, so many of our friends have been saying such wise things so much better than I could ever say them. Uh, and it's very tempting just to to share that. And uh, But I think it's really important to like reach out to people that mean something to you to let them know that they mean something to you. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just, you know, it's just fucking hard to like, even just wrap your head around it. Like. Yeah. I mean, truly. Yeah. All of it. <laughs> Yeah. But I was proud of you for saying, like, you know, you said this was helpful to me and you shared, like, an article about just things that we can do. It's it's so cliche about, like, putting the oxygen mask on yourself first so that you can help someone else uh, in the right. event of... A- <laughs> I'm like, like most things, that has been learned from Black mostly women activists <laughs> which is yeah. that yeah. which is that you know especially like the black activists who've been fighting their entire lives for like not just not just equality but also like voting rights and making sure that people are right. able to vote and are safe and a lot of the leaders in those movements who you know cross over with reproductive justice, like the women from Sister Song and, um, you know, say they're like, we have found that in order to keep going in our like rightful quest for equality and justice, sometimes we got to take a step back and like take care of ourselves and our own mental health and well-being. And white ladies, that's not like for you to just fucking sit down. I'm sorry, it isn't. I'm just saying, I am just saying you have to be aware of your of your tipping point, of your own mental health and well-being and the point at which right. it becomes just too much because quite frankly, there are so many things. Right. Um, well, by the way, the thing that you shared, what I loved about it, it didn't say at any point, like, just turn it all off. It was a no, lot of suggestions yeah. for finding the mode of information that is the most digestible and tolerable to you in a, in order to, like, go ahead more. Yeah, for me, like, I personally, I'll just tell you guys personally, um, for me, I need to read about things as opposed to watching a video of it. And right. I'm not like, I don't think that it lessens my motivation for wanting to see like justice and <sighs> wanting to help in any way I can. Right. But the like sort of constant bombardment of images and sounds to me is just too it's too overwhelming um so i so i read i have like a couple newsletters that i'm subscribed to news organizations i'm subscribed to um and this is like about this current war that's now happening, but also um, I do it with the politics in this country because it's really, it gets really right. overwhelming for me. And even Jessica right. Valenti's genius Substack newsletter, Abortion Every Day, I'm going to be honest with you guys, sometimes I don't read it every day. <laughs> sometimes I got to right. take a step back. Um, well, when you think about it, like this, this world has been through two world wars uh, at a time when, you know, you just heard the news on the radio or you sat down at 6 p.m. and saw... Some images. You know, 
yeah, saw some some selected images. And, you know, the world that we live in now is it's we have access to this information 24/7 for better and for worse and i think that there are some times when it is certainly for better but sometimes you know it's it's not i don't it's like you said it's not meant to happen first yeah. of fucking all Correct. but it's we're not meant to absorb every detail of everything happening everything everywhere all at once as the movie yeah. said you know i just our brains look, just there's can't actual work that way. there is i understand but there is actual validity to sometimes people need to see a fucking thing before they get it i i i know i understand the impact that that george floyd video had on a large yes. swath of american people who previously were like but i mean Right. And that changed a lot of people. And I recognize that. Yeah. And maybe you're one of those people. And like, by the way, okay, that's okay. Once you understand something, you know, you can't pretend like you don't understand it. Do you want to know what's funny about the, this next um, sponsor of our podcast? What? I already had purchased this. Uh, it doesn't surprise me. I had been seeing it and wanted yeah. to get it and then went ahead and got it. And it's a good one. <laughs> okay, guys, here's what it is. We're going to tell you. It's called The Hatch Restore 2. And you can think of it as like a bedside sleep guide. <laughs> Your ally. <laughs> and resting well. Um, it's like a little sophisticated sound machine, a light and an alarm clock, but it looks really pretty. Yes. And if you know me, you know that I need noise machines. Right. Um, but also, if you know me, you know that I wake up a lot during the night. And part of what I think I now know, having used this hatch for a minute, is that I think I was, like, always, like, nervous about waking up. Right. So I'd start to wake up early. Right. And I just have really bad sleep hygiene. And so uh, what I'm so appreciating about the hatch is that it's almost like a trainer, like, training you to sleep with light and sound cues when you should wind down and then gently waking me back up in the morning, which I appreciate a gentle wake up, I'm going to be honest. Yeah, so they have white, pink, or brown noise. I like the brown noise. They have other sleep sounds inspired by nature. <laughs> and the alarm in the morning, it doesn't jar you awake. <laughs> I don't like to be scared into my day. Me neither. I legit purchased this. I've been using it. Then they reached out and we're like, we were interested in advertising on the podcast. And normally, like, we need to try the things before we... Ever, but I was like, yes, I'm in. I already, already have, have it. it. I bought it. <laughs> I bought it full price. <laughs> right, exactly. I'm thinking we're entering into the holiday season. This would be such an excellent gift for the person in your life who is burning the candle at both ends. It's self-care all in one device, really. Maybe I'll buy one for Emily Beebe. Oh, Maybe I'll get one that's Emily a good Beebe. idea. And I can use our code because right now, Hatch is offering our listeners $20 off your purchase of a Hatch Restore 2 and free shipping at hatch.co slash best. Sleep deeply, wake gently with the Restore 2. Go to hatch.co slash best to get $20 off and free shipping. That's Hatch, H-A-T-C-H dot co c o slash best carry you ma <laughs> on my feet you guys come on come on every time i wear carry you ma's people are stopping me to ask me what are those shoes where did you get them i know they're so cute that's why have you been reading about the wrong shoe theory 
Like it's it's the new way to look effortless is to wear an outfit and then put on a shoe that you normally wouldn't put with that outfit. Oh, so, I've been doing like, that for years. I've been doing that for years. Of course you That's have. Like, yeah, this is like my whole vibe. Like it's, like it's like a sneaker with a dough and dress. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. 100%. So, so if I'm putting on like a fancy suit, putting on a pair of colorful Karyumas with it, and it just- So cute. Attracts attention and looks so cute. Um, They are truly the cool, sustainable sneaker brand- Worn and loved by skaters and surfers and me and Casey. <laughs> <laughs> they look classic, but the great thing about it is because now they're being made by Karyuma in 2023, they're also keeping us and our comfort and the planet in mind, which I appreciate. I appreciate it too. <laughs> we love them. And Karyuma is always keeping it very fresh, collaborating with different brands to make the cutest little sneakers, Pantone, the Peanuts. I have the Peanuts. Um, I love them. I know. Really cute. Unforgettable limited edition launches. They have like new fall shades right now. I love anyone that's like, we do it. We do a release. We're releasing. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm just like yes. obsessed. I'm it's, obsessed. It's a little something to look forward to in these days. Yeah. Carrie Yuma is a B Corp certified company, which is awesome, has a dedicated reforestation program based in the Brazilian rainforest. Their co-founders, David and Fernando, both grew up there. So it's a very close to home. And for every pair of sneakers sold, Cariuma plants two trees. They've already planted over 2 million trees to date. It's a lot That's of sneakers. Incredible. It's a lot of trees. Yeah. Guys, it's impressive. They ship all their sneakers free and fast in the U.S., and they offer worldwide shipping, 60-day free returns. They come right to your door. The packaging is as genius as the shoes. I was as impressed at the packaging as the shoes. And we've talked about this before, like when we talked about Karyumas. We love Karyumas. But the, my favorite thing is they don't arrive at your door and you open the box, and then you have to open another box with the shoe in them. It's all in, it's all in one. They Just figured one it out. They cracked the code. <laughs> They're thinking about everything, Karyuma. And they're thinking about you and your little feet. Or your big feet. Or your <laughs> medium-sized feet. I don't know your feet. I'm just saying Karyuma's got something for you. So check it out. And for a limited time, Busy Phillips is doing your best. Listeners can get an exclusive 15% off your pair of Karyuma sneakers. Go to karyuma.com slash best to get 15% off. It's C-A-R-I-U-M-A dot com slash best to get 15% off. Again, that's C-A-R-I-U-M-A dot com slash best for 15% off only for a limited time. Go get your feet cozies. This is only slightly like shifting gears. But I, you know, I never listen to podcasts, right? Right. Yeah. Um, okay. So I learned about this thing last week called quantum entanglement. Yes. Have you ever heard of it? Mm hmm. And then I listened to this really interesting podcast, which, by the way, was from 2015, which in and of itself was sort of like a wild journey to listen to a podcast from 2015 because it just felt like so different. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's a different planet. Yeah. But um, essentially, guys, okay, quantum entanglement is a theory that Einstein first, quantum, of course, I love this <laughs> quantum. Um, it's a scientific theory that basically <laughs> we're all our cells, you know, we're like all atoms, right? Right. Atoms and protons. And our cells get entangled. They it's actually they can they can get protons to switch like to become one, basically. Right. And I wonder, I didn't, I should have looked up what where they're at now. I know that China announced a couple of years ago that they had done like the longest distance of protons being basically connected. But the reason why it got brought up is because I was talking about 
right after Birdie was born, and she would be in her little bassinet, her co-sleeper next to me. Yeah. And I would have my eyes closed early in the morning, and I would feel her moving the way that she would move in my uterus. Yeah. And I would open my eyes and look over, and she would be moving that exact same way in her little swaddle. Like, I would feel her moving. Right. And it would make me open my eyes, and I would look over, and she would be moving in the exact way that I felt her moving in my fucking body, but she was not in my body anymore. Right. Okay. It's like my dogs are from the same litter, and they could not be more different. They're like mixed breed dogs, and they couldn't have more attributes of the different breeds that are mixed. And yet, whenever they are both asleep at the same time, no matter where they are in the house, if you look at one and then you go find the other one, they're asleep in the exact same position. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like wild positions. Well, and this idea of, I mean, it sort of is like quantum entanglement between humans really explains all kinds of phenomenon, right? Like a mother's intuition, why, especially for the first seven years of of a kid's life, moms are like, something's wrong with my baby. I know something's wrong with my baby. And doctors are like, calm down, ma'am. And you hear these stories right. all the fucking time. And then they're like, and turns out something was wrong with the baby, you know? Right. And because the fact is like your cells are so entangled, like your actual atoms are entangled. And so what they're feeling, you are feeling. And right. especially, you know, we've been like told we're crazy our whole lives for right. this thing. It's but probably, you know how we talk about inherited generational trauma. Yes. It's that's right. Pr- it's probably responsible for that. I was looking that's, on my phone cuz I remembered that Einstein said something funny about it. Um mm-hmm. and here's a quote from him. He referred to it as spooky action at a distance, <laughs> which I thought spooky was spooky action just at a distance. Very right, right. funny to think of Einstein calling something spooky. Right, because it is Weird, right? It's right. weird. It's weird when you reach for your phone to text your best friend and sh- and the phone rings and it's your best friend calling. Yeah. You yeah. know? So I manifestation, I've long believed yes. in like when you give and not just manifestation, but like when you give energy to something. Mm-hmm. One time, busy, I almost passed out. I was dating this boy in high school, and he had an ex girlfriend. And I just the drug dealer. felt that she she was my enemy. She hated me so much. She lived in another town, many many towns away. And one time, I was walking home from school on a very deserted like state highway. I was looking down at the ground. But I was thinking of her. I was like giving her energy. And I looked up and she was passing me on that highway in my town just at that moment. And like, this is a person I tried not to think about too much. You know what I mean? But I was like, either her energy put like that she was coming toward me, like she put that energy in my mind that I was about to see her and to like get ready for it. But I'll just say when I was like thinking of a person looking down at the ground, looked up and saw them driving by, I almost fainted. But I think that those kinds of, I mean, I do think that it's, I mean, to me, finding out that there was like a scientific discovery in the 50s that scientists are still um, studying because it legitimately would be like the only unhackable form of of communication. Right. Right. Because you can't fake entanglement on a, like, cellular atom level, right? Right. So, anyway, I've been fa- I've been really fascinated by this idea for the last week. And then I listened to that podcast from 2015 in which they talk a little bit about the actual atoms and protons and their entang- entanglement and what yeah. physicists are trying to prove, continue to prove, and how far they can stretch the distance between the protons, turning, having them essentially communicate and become this essentially the same cells, the same right. 
thing. But then the second part, it was like one of those NPR podcasts, you know? And the second part was like, you know, where they're like, today we're going to talk. Three, <laughs> today I have three stories for you. They're first, still calmly talking yeah, about they're the like, most freaky we're scientific. Talk, and, you know, what's really interesting about this? Okay, so anyway, the second part, the second chunk was highlighting this woman who has a kind of synesthesia that is emotional synesthesia. Oh. Which is... Yeah, so tell God, me about if you, that. If you don't know what synesthesia is, right. it's, where, it's, it's where receptors in your brain get like sort of the wires are a little crossed, right? So people who have... Um, there's different kinds, but people who there there's certain people who have synesthesia where like they see numbers as colors or they Music see sounds as colors sa- yeah sounds as sounds as colors. There's like a there's several different con- tastes. Yeah, taste can get confused with things. Words okay. have tastes. To Words people. have tastes exactly. Yeah. yeah, and so it's like your senses almost get entangled, right? Yes. In your brain. But I think one of my aunts had had like mild synesthesia, if that's possible, but she had words that tasted so bad to her. And of course, as a little kid, like I found it hilarious that there were certain sure. words that would almost have my aunt like Vomit. dry heaving. <laughs> but she said it. And I just thought, I was like, do you think it's, I thought it was so weird because grass was one of the words that would almost make her throw up. And, uh, and she, I remember her trying to describe it to me that I was like, do you think grass is gross? Like that's so, it's so common. And she was trying to explain to me, no, it's just the word grass has like a very specific thing that it does inside my body to me. And I can't handle hearing In her it. brain. Yeah. yeah. So this woman, they like <laughs> classic podcast <laughs> from 2015. They start the story where you don't know that there is like an actual scientific thing, which is like emotional synesthesia. But essentially, this woman lives her life. And when she goes in public, if she sees a, like a kid fall down, it, she feels like she just fell down. Her, right. And they do, they have proven this with brain scans, you know, like put it, hooking them up to like with all the electrodes or whatever, when they see a person in a great deal of pain, they experience a great deal of pain when they see a person emotionally bereft, like they start crying, they start crying. It's like almost like the most intense form of empathy that you can imagine, right? Right. We're literally, they're like, they're, we're watching it happen. Their brain is lighting up in that, in that center, in that space where it should light up if they were just, if they just fell to the ground and hit their knee. Right. And they are just sitting there watching it happen. So this is like a real thing. But then they're like, you know, we haven't studied or they, what they need to study further is like, what level of emotional synesthesia does everyone have? Do, do do normal people have versions of it that like aren't aren't as severe as this woman, right? Like right. she's like a very special case, like a very extreme case of having this thing where like she was, you know, describes being at the grocery store and a kid falling backwards out of a grocery cart, like flipping out of it. Oh God. And she like, was sort of racing to try to catch the kid and the kid fell and hit his head. And when that happened, she like collapsed to the ground and was like, couldn't see and her head was ringing and all this like stuff. Oh, like God. It's really. And it's also super sad because she ends up like essentially deciding Injured. that she can't leave her house. Oh, Like God. it's not worth it to her to be in public. And her children are like, we kind of just want our mom to be able to live, be normal. And the eldest daughter has it. Oh, God. it like runs in the fan. It's it's a thing that like is hereditary. Hereditary. I think That's... all synesthesia is. Oh, that that makes sense. You know what I was thinking? You're as you're talking, it's making me think like 
It's interesting that this is interesting to you because we've talked about ADHD and rejection-sensitive dysphoria. And I believe that I've read that rejection-sensitive dysphoria in people with ADHD actually, like, lights up the same place where you're physically hurt in your brain. Like it feels like a physical hurt. Whereas to someone else being rejected might be more of an emotional hurt Mm -hmm. that it's like for some people being rejected is physically painful. And so it's, it's not the same, but it's interesting and, and interestingly related. I feel like that like things can just happen in your brain that almost Make something, make something true that someone else might not see as true. Make something tangible that someone yes. else might not feel as tangible yes. or true. Yes, Casey. A hundred percent. This is like, you know, and I've been thinking a lot. I've really, for like basically a week, been really thinking about this idea of quantum entanglement and and also just like our entanglement in general with the rest of the with the world that we're constantly being confronted with you know yeah. and how overwhelming it is for some people not for everybody and you see that like you see that in kids too like yeah. cricket is not as overwhelmed by humanity or by like other kids or by stuff that happens as Birdie always has been, you know? And like, I think Eli was like the same in a way to Birdie, which is like, still Birdie needs like a break sometimes from people. Like she's like, it's too much. It's just too much. Even when there's nothing bad happening, it's just overwhelming to have so much Around And I feel like, I don't know, especially in this, these last several years, like the collective pain, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, Eli was a 9-11 kid. Like he, like he was old enough and aware to know like what happened, uh, when 9-11 happened, and I always just, I always thought that it informed who he became, like it informed his subsequent anxiety, and I'm sure to some extent it did. Like, literally, we lived on the block where all the firefighters he knew, because little kids care about firefighters, died. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we were in a building, a landmark building that was evacuated because they didn't know if all landmark buildings in New York City were coming under attack, you know, he so he knows what it feels like to be scooped up and evacuated out of somewhere. I always thought, like, it probably informed who he was in terms of anxiety, but I just think that probably, yeah, he and Birdie were, like, built different. And growing up in a time like this is, is rough for them because they, you know— they just regulate it differently, I think, than, yeah. than other But people. I think, like, <sighs> I don't know. Part of what is so interesting to me about the idea of quantum entanglement and the fact that, like, physicists know about this and scientists have studied it and continue to, is that, like, you hear these designations or, like, these titles, like, like highly sensitive person or whatever. And, like, people, like, roll their eyes, kind of. It's, you know it what I mean? Sounds like a, it sounds like an insult, you know? Like, it totally does. Yeah. And it sounds made up. Yeah. And I don't know. To me, there was just something really gratifying to hearing that. And then, and also, like, well, fucking, of course, no one ever bothered to tell women that, like, mother's intuition is actually probably, like, has a scientific basis in, like, cellular right. connection and entanglement. Because, by the way, I do want to say this. You don't even have to carry a baby 
to have quantum entanglement with your cells. If you're caretaking a child as like the, you know, as one of the primary caretakers, your cells will entangle. Like that's right. just the the idea of quantum entanglement. Right. Is that your cells, our cells are constantly entangling. Yeah. Which is so fucking all, wild. We're all stardust. Because we're all just all stardust. Being held together mostly by, I don't even know what, how we're, we're being held together mostly, but we're not completely ever together. You know what I mean? Like our, like parts of us go off and become parts of other things. Um, and other people. And other people. You can have cellular entanglement with fucking strangers. It's But wild. also, it's like why breakups can be so devastating. Right. Or why death feel of somebody that you're very, very close with feels right. so devastating. Right. Because you're part of you is gone. Like yeah. literally an actual part of you. Yeah. And I would just like to point out that if you're looking for a beautiful side, is that when you break up or when you lose someone, part of you is gone, but part of them is there to stay with you. Right. Yeah. I know. Um, yeah, it's... It's really, it's interesting. I love science busy. What if, what if I'm a real science bitch? <laughs> well, you but know, I'm thing. always I like, mean, I'm always uh, thumbing through the pages of a weird scientific journal. I've done it at every TV show I've ever worked at. And people are always like, are you reading that for a bit? So I love when you listen to a podcast about quantum entanglement and tell me all about it. Well, shout out to Shannon Woodward because <laughs> she's the real science bitch. And um, she is the one that was like, oh, yeah, well, that's quantum, quantum entanglement. And I was like, wait, what? Wow. Like, oh, busy. You don't know about that? I was like, no, I don't know about that, Shannon. Wow. Who wow, would have wow. told me? That's very cool. I know. It's cool but and frightening. It's cool and it's frightening. And also like... I don't know. I've also just been thinking about it so much <sighs> this through this this weekend and everything that's been oh, fuck unfolding in Israel and Palestine and like feeling and also just in our own country and like it just is so painful to know that we just all are the fucking same thing. Like, we're just all a part of each other. Right. And yet people hold so much fucking hate in their hearts for, I don't know. That, well, and just by what you just said, they're hating themselves as well. Right. Which is kind of where I think all hate comes from to begin with. You hate yourself. Mm -hmm. You're so unhappy. It's so true. It's so that, it's so true. You know. I will say for especially for those of you with kids, I can only speak to my experience. You know, I'm talking a little bit about my son and like living through 9-11 in New York City. Not that it's comparable uh to to what happened um this week, but you know, just talking about that experience is that, like, I felt so much for what my kid was going through because he was a little kid and little kids are, they're the center of their own universe. So he was only thinking about, like, it will this building that I'm in right now, will it fall down? Like, that's what he was worried about. Um, I will say that as soon as he got old enough, a really helpful thing to just deal with those things that he was still dealing with was to get him involved in volunteering for things, um, things that he was passionate about. And what he loved the most at that time was animals. And so he volunteered at like a nature rehabilitation center in our town that was very lucky uh, uh, for us. 
they agreed to like take him on when he was a little younger than you were supposed to be to be a volunteer in that program. And it was really meaningful and transformative for him. He also went on to be like a, a volunteer builder, which made him, it gave him a sense of accomplishment. He's he's pretty capable with that stuff uh, to this day, but also... Um, you know, just expanded his horizons a little bit. Um, But it's so, that was just the way that we managed it. And, um, you know, does he still deal with anxiety to this day? He sure does. Um, He'd be the first person to tell you that. But it also kind of forged the person that he is now. And I think, like, he would do anything to help anyone and uh and i'm so grateful that we were able to sort of get him on that on that program cuz i think besides like it's great to help people we should all help people but i also think it's given him such a purpose in life to just know you know when you know you're the kind of person that would do anything to help someone i think it just kind of changes the way that you absorb everything around you yeah, so I, again, it's just our experience or whatever, but if any of you have kids who are around 10 or 12 and this is happening and you're wondering, like... Well, it's not, I mean, also, case it's like the, you know, the mass shootings and the, like, right. a lot of our kids, and this is why I say, like, I, some kids are just, a, like a little bit more sensitive, a little bit more yeah. open than than others. Because I'm not going to say Cricket's not affected by, like, the active shooter drills and the, like, you know, the stuff that she's been subjected to. But, you know, on a very deep level, Birdie was constant. It was always in the yes. back of her brain. Yeah. Like... When we would go to movie theaters, when we right. would go to malls. Same. I mean, these kids, like our ki- American kids have been subjected to terror. Right. Like, right. Yeah. they are living with that. Yeah. Because none of the, because they know now, these kids know that it could be any school, anytime. Right. And that's why I'm thinking that, that that everything that's happening globally is probably affecting them all the time because it, it's very close to feelings that they identify with so strongly, you know? So it's just, and the way every kid handles it is different. And I would say Lincoln's probably more like cricket, just more, it's more internal than than external. I think it's but, more internal. Yeah, but also like, but I mean, gen, genuinely, like, I don't, I think that for whatever reason, just the way that she's, why she's wired more like Mark. Like, right. I I don't think she thinks about it right. all the time, you right. know? Right. She's not and catastrophizing or... She's... No. Whereas, you know, Birdie and I over here are like... <laughs> but I that's the trick. Like, we still... Like, you still got to get up, right? You still have to do things. And that's what... To your point of, like, getting Eli involved in service stuff. Like, Birdie definitely also, like, got involved in some service stuff, but she got you know, sort of active in learning history. That became right. like, a, this has become a really big thing for Bernie. Like, right, reading about knowing history. And for me, you know, when we talked last week and I was feeling really sort of already very like shaky about the state of, especially our country. Right. And then I was, and then I volunteered, like, you know, I volunteered essentially, but like I, I did these three, I showed up to these three different events filled with people, like trying to make a difference or whatever. And like, all of a sudden it felt to me like a little bit lighter for a minute. And then. Right. Um. Well, listen, we're all just doing what we can. And uh, if if you're a parent, I can only speak from my own experience having like an adult kid that's gone through this shit. Like, let them do what they can too. You know what I mean? Give them the opportunity to make their day more meaningful. Uh, 
you know, because we know that it makes us feel a little bit better and feel like we accomplished something and did something valuable with our day. Kids don't know that yet. So they might need a little, a little guidance to do that, but give them an opportunity to make themselves feel like they can be of service and like they're doing something positive, you know? I don't know. That's just my two cents. Whatever. (laughs) But speaking of things that will make us feel a little more positive. (laughs) And for kids, things that are for kids. (laughs) Mm -hmm. We have with us two very special people I'm so excited to meet. Hi. Thanks for having us. (laughs) You know how much I love Lumi. Yeah, I've been a longtime fan and user of Lumi, again, before they were ever a sponsor of this podcast. Guys, we really, like, put the products where our money is. Wait, what? <laughs> we put, uh, yeah, we we put something, something, somewhere. We put and something put somewhere, Lumi, but you know what I feel good about? Knowing everywhere. that Lumi, Lumi can go everywhere. Yeah. Because it's pH balanced. It's not going to mess anything up. Right. It's a whole body deodorant. You mm-hmm. can use it on your pits. You can use it on your privates. You can use it anywhere. And I have to say, for our big boobed girls, between your boobs, under your boobs, it's really a game changer. I don't even consider myself a big boob girl. I'm just not. I'm not. They're fine. But I will say that the working out sweat boob stink is real. <laughs> and Lumi has changed the game for me. But I also love those wipes, the deodorant wipes. They're when I so was, good to toss in your bag. Yeah, or your kid's backpack, guys. Yeah. I even have used, you know when kids go through the phase where their feet stink? Like, it's, yes. just FYI, guys, if your kids are younger, whatever, I don't know. It's coming. There is, it does stop smelling <laughs> so bad. Your feet, Their feet do, do, like, chill out at a certain point. Yeah. I'm just saying from experience. But until that point, let me tell you a little trick. Lumi Dio wipe on those little piggies. <laughs> and you like you have no issues. Your kids' feet will be smelling great. You'll be fine. Oh You'll feel good. Um, you know what I heard? The wipes are so popular. I heard that an entire truckload was stolen from the Lumi warehouse. Is that true? Yeah. But that's kind of amazing. I mean, it wasn't us. Lumi, we just want you to know we are big fans of the wipes, but it wasn't us. We are totally innocent. Not us, although now I'm like jealous. <laughs> I, want, I want an entire truckload. Back it up. <laughs> um, listen, we have an offer for you. New customers get $5 off Lumi's starter pack with the code BEST at lumideodorant.com. Um, and here's why the starter pack is perfect. This is where this is where I started with Lumi. Um, it comes with the solid stick deodorant, the cream tube deodorant, which is incredible. That's like worth the price of admission, that cream tube deodorant. You'll see. Agreed. And then two free products of your choice. I got a mini body wash and the deodorant wipes and then free shipping. So I tried everything and I was like, oh, wow. Delivers on everything. It's aluminum free, baking soda free, paraben free, pH balanced. I mean, created by an OBGYN. So like, it's just, it's got everything. And you know, I'm very sensitive. I have sensitive skin. Right, right. And that's what the starter pack for me was like also important because I always want to try, even when things are like, have all the claims. Sometimes, sometimes it doesn't work out for my skin. We don't know. I don't know why. Right. Could probably look into it more, but that's not for this. What I'm <laughs> saying to you is that the starter pack is perfect because you get to try all of the things, see which products you want to order more of, which is going to be everything. Just heads up. Well, a special offer for our listeners. New customers get $5 off a Lumi starter pack with code BEST at lumideodorant.com. That essentially equates to over 40% off your starter pack when you visit lumideodorant.com and use code BEST best. You got to try it. Let us know how you like it. Well, this episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. I think we could all use a little help right now. I'm not going to lie. I mean, yeah. I know I could. I know I can. I know I am. <laughs> I am. Sometimes I feel like my brain is getting in my own way. And 
when I'm in that position, it's really daunting to seek out someone to talk to and someone to help me figure it out. So the reason that I'm such a fan of BetterHelp is that it takes the daunting part of finding someone to talk to away. Well, listen, I've had this conversation with friends of mine. Friends who I, quite frankly, thought would have assumed were in therapy. Right. And... (laughs) And they're like, well, I was, but then uh, this thing, my insurance changed, and then on any da da da. And so then I know, and I got to find something. It's just so hard. And I'm human. I'm going to. Which is all uh, valid. All valid. But you know what's almost like impossible when you're already feeling overwhelmed by a million different things? Then trying to figure out how to find a therapist on top of it turns right. out. So this is why I do think better help is very timely and necessary addition to our lives, like to help people find therapy. Because, you know, there's apps for everything, right? Right. And there should be a way to get people connected with licensed therapists who can take their insurance, who can see you on your timetable, like when you're available with your job, your work, your kids, whatever. Right. And Um, if you connect with someone who isn't right for you as a therapist, you can switch it up with BetterHelp. Oh, yeah. Sometimes the first therapist you talk to, you're like, I don't know if it's quite the match. Yeah. But it's entirely online, which means that it's designed to be very convenient and very flexible and suited to your schedule. And yeah, you can can try, you get matched with a therapist. You can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Um... I don't know if you're thinking of starting therapy, and you should be if you're not already in it. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you should be. Um, why don't you just give better help a try? See how it works for you. Make friends with your brain. <laughs> Make your brain your friend <laughs> with better help. Visit betterhelp.com slash busy today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash busy busy. Guys, we just want you to be great. And if not great, just a little bit better. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I am recording. Excellent. I'm also recording. Oh my God, I sound like a grandparent. Wait, I'm kind of obsessed. And you can hear us? (laughs) Yes, I can hear you. We're in our 30s, I swear. (laughs) Are you sure? I'm an elder millennial. (laughs) Oh, oh my gosh. We have here with us two very exciting, very smiley faces, which I already feel 100% better seeing you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank Aaron Jackson and Josh Sharp. You guys, yes. um, first of all, I just want you to know that everyone's excited to see Dick's The Musical <laughs> in theaters. Yeah, now? theaters. Yeah. <laughs> It's in theaters now, guys. Yeah. It's New York, exciting. LA, San Francisco, and nationwide on the 20th. So God bless us when the rest of the nation gets this, you know? <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. And for, listen, I know a little bit about, I haven't seen it yet, but for our our listeners at home who maybe have not watched the trailer 7,000 times as I have, <laughs> <laughs> This is based on a stage show you guys did it at UCB, right? Correct. Yeah, which is the classic developmental track for films. Totally. I was going to say, that's Hereditary how most movies... Hereditary was a two-man <laughs> show at UCB. <laughs> yeah. That's Everything how Scorsese everywhere all at once. Is like, he's, work, he's working Scorsese. things yeah, that's out he, at UCB, right? Yeah. yeah. He, he and Leo. <laughs> he and Leo went to UCB Franklin, um, and they just sort of worked it all yeah. out. And, uh, they just throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks. <laughs> <laughs> I love it um, so much. Ha- so, okay, so this happened initially at UCB. Is UCB where you met? Yes, we yeah. did meet at UCB. Mortifying, and- but we met doing improv. Mm-hmm. So I know that'll <laughs> sink a career when people know that. But, yeah. <laughs> but clearly you must be very good improvisers. We had well, some fun. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah. I taught it. I taught it. <laughs> some of my least favorite people taught improv. So <laughs> oh, yeah. that's great. You and me both busy. <laughs> I know. Oh, actually, Aaron, you and I have something in common. 
What's that? Our beautiful we hair. Both, beautiful long we hair, both yeah. kissed Alan Starzynski. <laughs> yes, yes, Alan. Alan was sweet. on my first team at UCB. Sweet, oh sweet Alan. Gosh. Alan is very sure sweet I kissed too. Alan too in that chapter. Gonna, I don't remember I'm it. I'm gonna kiss but he's Alan a now. Yeah, Gosh. Gosh. He'll, Alan could not remember us. if you had ever kissed. Just feels like odds are. I don't remember yeah. either, but I'm just Occam's razor. We kissed. You That's know? what I said. I was like, I'm sure you guys did, but right. he was like, just on. To, to, I know that Aaron and I have kissed That's a lot. Good. Yeah. It's good that he is sticking to the facts that the we facts. know for sure. He's, you know, <laughs> that's right. Um, <laughs> but I okay. But so Dick's the musical is essentially it's it's your homage a little bit to Parent Trap, a movie that we all love. <laughs> yes, it is. And it's so funny. It started because we were doing it as a two-man show at UCB, like never thinking of it as a film. It was just right. like a show we wrote for ourselves. And we people keep asking us, like, why did you base it on The Parent Trap? And the real answer is at the time we were like, you know, it's pretty easy. We can both play yeah. the twins. And then when you meet one of the parents, one of them could play that. It was like most good art. It came of logistics that we were like that. <laughs> <laughs> but what is true is that the parent trap is sort of a story structure like the Odyssey or Romeo and Juliet that we yeah. sort of all, you know, that's a that's one of the established forms of story. You can just that lay we, your own take on top of this form that we all know and love, little girls tricking their parents back together. <laughs> There's only seven stories, right? Is yeah. That yeah. So, and parent and, trap is number two, I believe. Yeah. I think it's the and, second story. It's the second story. Groundhog's <laughs> Day is one of them now. That's yeah. probably a thing. Yeah. Everybody's doing Groundhog's Day. Correct. So. I hope we bring about the resurgence of parent trap as a, as an accepted yeah. narrative modality. Uh, the parent okay. trap genre <laughs> of right. films. Yes. The oeuvre that is parent <laughs> trap. <laughs> Can I just ask about the parent trap? Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, we do love the parent trap, actually. Yeah. But Who is the hero to you in the parent trap? Oh, wow. And has it changed as you've grown older? Wow. Certainly as a child. I grew up on the Haley Mills one, and then the Lindsay yes. Lohan came out, and I was probably a little too old for it, but still enjoyed it. Um, and the hero, God. Meredith Blake, I think. Yeah, Not no, even the character, just the actress. You know, yeah, Meredith love Blake Meredith. is the hero. <laughs> we do love the villain. Yeah, I do always respond to the villain. I always, feel, I, I, feel, like I always the, um, feel bad for that woman that's, like, brought into this. Like, she doesn't know what the hell's going on. She you did know nothing what I mean? wrong. She did She's just wrong. trying to get down with a hot dad. Like, Yeah. Have a what? nice life. A rich yeah, life. the the villain are the parents that split up the well, twins. Well, yes, that, that truly is, is a, crazy. <laughs> that's the thing we talk about in the movie. I, for one, we actually are very adamant that this film is never parodies the Parent Trap. It really is just doing it as a story structure, and it's like a runaway train. We do it in like thirty minutes. And Larry yeah. Charles, the director, has actually, as a point of pride, never seen the Parent Trap. He's like, I don't <laughs> even know what happens in it. What is it? I don't know. <laughs> we really didn't want it to be par- parody, but um. That is a joke that comes up in the show because, you know, originally we were just like, oh, if grown men instead of little girls do the parent trap, it's no longer cute. It's so weird and gross. And then when you start to analyze it, you're like, but what the parents did in the first place is actually fully psycho. You know, like, so they're actually also awful. So it was like, okay, so then let's just make everyone awful, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Everyone's awful, but your parents are played by Nathan Lane and Megan Mullally, who. Treasures. Treasures. True. Treasures. (laughs) <laughs> and, and it's sort of brought about the um, Nathan Lanesance now that he's like on a two picture deal with A24. <laughs> yeah, he was in Bo's Afraid. Figuring out who he is again in a way that I love. Oh my God. You, guys are, As you guys are a part of that. You yeah, get to claim you're... like responsibility for it. They're the best. It is funny because like when we were talking about casting this movie, they're both our first choices, but it was like we want people who are like, True funny, like comedian level funny. And then also they have to get this thing, which is very crazy gonzo. Specific funny. <laughs> specific funny. And then we're like, and also they need to be able to sing. And not in that way that sometimes you let a movie star sort of like stumble their way through it. We're like, we need real singers. And then we we whittled it down. We were like, okay, so there's only two humans who can do that. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so they were always like our first choices. That's oh amazing. Gosh. Wait, did, did the stage show, did you guys write the music and lyrics for the stage show? We wrote... The lyrics, yeah, we wrote the lyrics and then Carl St. Lucie, our composer, wrote for the stage show and for the movie, wrote the music. So the three and of then us together. They worked with Marius de Vries, who's the executive music producer who did like La La Land and Moulin Rouge and produced Dork albums, who's like a legend. And so he produced all this music. And I, I think a big part of the reason why the film works because it is a wild movie. The move, the music is so much better than it should be. Like right. the songs are very good, <laughs> even when they're so stupid. So it's right. like, we feel very thankful to have 
Carl, who's a brilliant composer, and then Marius, who's a legend who like arranged a lot of the stuff and scored stuff. And so, yeah, it's like sort of sneaky good music sometimes for being real dumb. I gotta <laughs> say something. Since this isn't a video podcast, we're talking about you two playing twin brothers, but I can see them, everybody listening. So I just want to say, and I mean this in the best way, Josh is giving me like great <laughs> Lin-Manuel Miranda vibes. Hey. And Aaron is giving me like Matt Bomer, but with long, silky <laughs> wow. hair. Wow! Does that feel... One, we have... We haven't gotten those two references, and I'll take it. I usually get Hillary Swank. Hillary Swank. Well, I can see it. I can see it. I get it. For a long time, I got Jared Kushner. So, (laughs) no, I'm getting like Kushner at all, honey. I would much rather Lynn and Bomer. You have big Lynn energy, and I adore Lynn. I love him so much. So it's it's just making me very happy. But it's also kind of funny to imagine you guys being twins, which is a great part of the trailer of the one of the central jokes of the film. Yeah, sorry. Very meta uh, sort of movie, not uh, that sort of calls out constantly that it's fake and that it is a movie. Um, That's part of the style of the humor. So yeah, one of the main jokes is that we we're identical twins, and it's like fuck you, we are. Um, yeah. Another one of the main jokes is that we're playing straight guys and that it's yes. incredibly brave for queer actors to play straight. So, like, you know, there's a lot of um, say, uh, cartoony acting going on. Yes, yes. Stylized. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Okay, but, like, for real, though, this is not, like, a usual thing that happens to <laughs> no, absolutely two, not busy <laughs> <laughs> two man shows from UCB right um, a lot of people's takes on this movie have been I can't believe it exists and to that we always are like we agree Same. it is it is wild that this movie got made well how tell us you ha- a little bit about how it got made yeah we were doing it at UCB and then our agent was just inviting a bunch of you know industry folks to see it, which is, you know, agent doing his job in a good way. And Corey Adelson from Chernin Entertainment came to see it. And she psychotically was like, do you guys think this would be a good movie? And we were like, I mean, it is based on the parent trap. And then as everyone knows, it is hard to get anything made in Hollywood. So when anyone is like, do you want to make a movie? You're like, of course. (laughs) Yes, I do. Uh, And we always thought it should be a movie. Um, And then we just, we, Pitched it to the upper ups at Chernin, and they, I don't know why, said yes. And then um, it was with 20th Century Fox for a minute, and then they read the script, and they were like, obviously not. And we were like, of course. And then... <laughs> really, um, they were like, the mom's pussy falls off? Okay, yeah. this is going to be a pass from Fox. And we were like, Stop totally, it. we totally. agree, we agree. They and don't like it- realistic cinema. No. <laughs> yeah. Rude. And then it um and then it found A24 and from there, you know, that 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 was a much better home for it and um it just kind of just kept taking steps, 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 steps until you're like, oh no, you've sunk too much money in it and now you have to make it. Well, and the other nice thing is people keep asking us like, how did you pitch this? And it is the joys that we rarely had to pitch it because right. it was this UCB show that became like a weird little hit. Like UCB shows would run like two months and this we did for like a year and a half because people kept coming back and it would sell out. And so it had a little word of mouth, but was not, we thought we'd get a general at Comedy Central out of it. Do you understand? Like we were yeah. not like, <laughs> you're so like then when web series. It, Are we doing web series again? Yeah. Yeah. Truly. Really <laughs> so then I think because the show existed, they were willing to be like, well, the show is something, turn it into a script. And then because that script existed, they were like, you know, like it, it, I think if we'd ever been in the room trying to pitch this idea, they would be like, no way. But there was a time at A24 when they were sort of set up to do it, that we met them and we, we gently called them. We, we were sort of joking. We were like, we want this to be the hereditary of comedies. And A24 <laughs> thought we were serious, I they think, because like, they truly were cool. like, great idea. <laughs> now, oh what does that God. phrase even mean? I can't it's, tell it's you. It's nonsense, but, but that's <laughs> fucking brilliant. That's how you get That's how you get your fucking movie made. That's it's visceral. I will say, having been in audiences watching it, it does get a visceral response that, <laughs> that some comedies don't get. There's a lot of screaming at the screen at certain points, and I don't know yeah. if that's a standard practice for your, you know, your major comedies these days. Well, I have been a longtime comedy writer. My friend Steve Young once said to me, you have comedy damage. That's his name for when I don't laugh at anything. I just go, oh, that's funny. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you know, like I'm just constantly evaluating. So I want a comedy movie that I scream at because that means I'm oh, surprised and right. grossed out and horrified. And that's what I want so bad. 
us too. And we're just like way, true yeah. joke perverts. Like I do think we just like want like a joke every we would always be mad if a line wasn't a joke and sometimes we'd have to be like well don't forget that's a setup for a joke later and it's like all right fine i'll write it you know and i'm not even saying all the jokes work i just think i we like a comedy that just like throws a lot of shit at the wall and is trying to make you laugh always and then there is a bit of that yeah Yeah. and then there's you know so parts are definitely like offensive and outrageous but it's also like absurd and it's broad and it's physical and it's silly and it's trying to do like a bunch of stuff but then i think some of those big absurd moments and the outrageous moments get that thing you love about like well, Borat does it, but also like John Waters movies and some of those movies mm-hmm. where they, they are trying to get you all to like sort of be together in a theater being like, oh, my fucking God. And yeah. I think it's like I miss I miss that. And in, in modern comedies, you know, I have a question. Right? So you guys must be fans of tons of hilarious movies. What is your most favorite screamable comedy moment from another movie oh, wow. that you've ever seen? Oh, that's a question. great question. Really putting him on the spot, Kate. I know. Screamable I should have asked. Screamable comedy I- moment. <laughs> well, I, we'll get there. I'm going to say ones that are not it and we'll get there because we've been thinking a lot in press just like comedies that like influenced us. And a yeah. lot of them are like Airplane and stuff like that that's joke line, but also stuff like Waiting for Guffman that felt very sure. like you know, like queer and specific and weird. Yeah. Um, what are screamable comedies, Aaron? Can I tell you the, the scene that I remember? Well, obviously there's something about Mary. Yeah. Um, oh, I yes. remember screaming at that. Oh, oh the, you know, uh, Team America. The, oh, uh, Team America. Uh, oh my God. I remember I watched it on a plane. <laughs> I watched it on a plane on a friend's laptop. And mm-hmm. not only was the whole movie screamable, but a flight attendant came up and said we couldn't be watching that movie because it had nudity. And we were of so embarrassed. And we were trying to shut the laptop. And then another flight attendant came up and she was like, it's puppets. And they yeah. got into a fight in the oh, aisle of the plane. One saying they, that we had the right to watch puppet nudity and the other being like, no, absolutely not. And we were like, it's wow. fine, it's fine. We don't want to watch it. It's fine. <laughs> we'll skip the nudity. Uh, There's nudity horrible. in our film. And I would argue that when we're naked, Aaron and I, it's puppet nudity. So if anyone <laughs> wants nudity, to, I would say we are puppets. Also puppet nudity. Yeah, and I, want to, like, I want to get a job in the future that requires nudity just so I can have request a puppet. To take yeah. Yeah. Now. Yes. Yes. Not a body yes. double, a puppet. I don't want yeah. a puppet. <laughs> Team America is a great one. It's Team a good America one. I also one. would submit in the film Spy, which I think is totally underrated. Oh, yeah. I love Spy. It is underrated. When Melissa McCarthy, who is not a spy, is oh, uh, working as a spy, when she shoots the guy and then she barfs onto his body. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Barf is funny. You know what else it, I'm saying? It wasn't like an outrageous scream. It was like an, oh my God, this is so stupid scream was Barb and Star. Like I was... Yeah. Screaming at Barb and Star, Star. Yes. even though I know it wasn't like gross out, it was like just so viscerally I stupid. I was just like, I loved Barb and, Star. Loved Barb and Star. Oh, good. I love that. I, you guys are giving me like such a nice list of things to review in preparation for going to see your, <laughs> your yeah. movie. I, an old, co- I really do lo- like the, the joke align stuff. I do love like bringing up Mel, baby. Mel Brooks, bringing up baby, uh, the Marx Brothers, like that kind of like rat-a-tat, rat-a-tat, like never let up jokes. Even if you're like, this is so dumb, you're like, we're not, there's no breath. <laughs> it's right, just right. jokes. I, I Have do you love all those seen, um, ha- this is, you're too young for it, but Johnny Dangerously? No. I haven't seen that. I'm going to give you that recommendation. But I'm only 19 years old. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 19 tomorrow, 19 tomorrow. <laughs> 19 tomorrow. <laughs> You both look 19. Um, wow. Check out Johnny Dangerously. Like a I feel 19 like 19 year old Lin Manuel. It's in the vein. Oh my God. Can you imagine the energy? Okay, Johnny Dangerously. I'm, I'm writing this down. Write it I down. It right from you. the very first shot, it, it has me oh, laughing. It, what mean, is Johnny listen. Dangerously? Who was in that? It's Michael Keaton plays a gangster, like oh, a fun. 1920s gangster. And okay. 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 It's. Yeah, Maureen Stapleton, I think, it's is sort of mother. reminding me as I'm looking at it online of What's Up Doc with Barbara Streisand. I which love is another What's like up, very Doc. funny oh my movie. God, I love that. Yeah, yeah. Check it out, you guys. Madeline Kahn. Ugh, Madeline yeah. Kahn. I just watched Clue, you guys, with my Ugh. 10-year-old. Oh my God. It was so that's good. another that's a joke line too, other than when they're like suspense moments. But even those are funny. Even I, those are funny. I like love that rat attack. Pace of Clue. Or Me too, like and every, I missed them. Like, yeah. everything yeah. is a joke. 
You a lot of comedies now are sort of forced to be dramedies. And I even like a lot of them, but I just of like course, miss the ones yeah. that are like, what if you just did a bunch of jokes? <laughs> you know? What if yeah, your yeah. stomach hurt at the end of the movie from <laughs> yeah. laughing and you pee yeah. yourself a little bit? Yeah, I love that. I'm so glad you're bringing that back, that pace. Wet hot, wet hot. I want, I want yes. to be wet being 15-year-olds watching Wet Hot American Summer. Okay, guys, I'm going to tell you Summer. something now, like old lady glamour smoking my fucking pen over here. And it's because <laughs> I said pen. I don't mean like a vape. I literally, it's, it's an actual pen. pen. It's like I, but she has lit pretending. it on fire and she's trying to smoke it. Let the <laughs> listener know um, Lizzie is having it's trouble. Melting plastic. <laughs> there are a few jobs that I'm fucking like that I ho- have held on <gasps> to my entire career that I am bummed that I didn't get. Yeah. And Wet Hot was uh, one of them. Uh, who were you supposed to be or who were you up for or whatever? Just, I just thought, I, I think I auditioned. Who cares? For the yeah, Liz Banks part. part. Liz yeah, Liz Banks. Yeah. But who is fabulous in it? Yeah. She's great. She's fabulous. Fine. You know, Fine. did she need it? Could it have helped <laughs> me more? Probably. You know what I mean? Let's be real. She was like sea biscuit. I mean, you know, but whatever. Anyway, but the point is, I fuck because I fucking love that movie. Um, <laughs> like I want to say seven years ago at the same at Sketchfest, mm-hmm. they did like an on stage. <gasps> reunion and cast reading and wildly Janine Garofalo couldn't make it right and they oh, asked wow. me to fill in Amazing. on stage and so for one night only you never and Liz that. was there you got what? act against Liz Liz <laughs> yes was there. Liz was there I mean it was the, it was the entire cast wow Liz oh, and Liz so are cool. buds so there's no hard feelings oh by there. the way yeah our kids like went to school together like Liz and I are fine I but love. I Truly, we are, guys. No, I'm anyway. I love no. Liz Banks. Are you kidding? I love no, she's that the best. you said she's like Sea Biscuit. <laughs> she was at the time. She was like, she was she's a like champagne. She is a thoroughbred. <laughs> she didn't need to do wet hot. She was like Sea Biscuit. She, was really biscuit. Good. she like was like in like big movies with like she big, was she's big like big movies. movie star. Yeah. Seabiscuit's a big movie star. There's not many films that are named after the actor playing it. Seabiscuit's a huge movie star. That's that is right. True. Did you did you see recently they brought out the animatronic Seabiscuit to the strike line for people to take no. that's not true. No. Oh I was we're so in New York. Envious. LA be wild. LA be wild. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's Imagine Dragons and animatronic horses. In New and York, I it's d- just a bunch of like sad comedy writers yeah. stomping around, you know. Jackie Hoffman. <laughs> yeah, we get Jackie Hoffman. <laughs> we get <have> Victor Garber. <laughs> Love them both. Love them both. Love them both. Oh, love them both. You love them both. Icons. Icons. Oh, my God. I will say, I will say, having picketed both in New York and L.A., you know, I live in New York now. New York is, a, it, it wasn't as much fun. It's gritty. <laughs> New York is gritty. Yeah, it was it's the, gritty. It's the gritty. law and order. But it felt more real, right? It felt like you were with real people. <laughs> yeah. Like some <laughs> some real shit could go down. Yeah. You never yeah. know. You never oh fucking know. Okay, guys, so now are we turning this back into a musical for Broadway? Is that what's going to oh happen? Oh, my God. Apparently at the um, at the, at the the LA premiere, um, this British woman, who I don't even know who she was, was talking to Nathan Lane, and she's like, well, you must take it to the West End. And Nathan Lane's like, must we? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> one, of, one of the great ways to impersonate Nathan Lane is to sort of just say back what you just heard with, with Nathan Lane's stink on it. Like, ask me anything. Ask me anything, Busy. <laughs> Um, so, so do you like living in New York? Do I like living in New York? <laughs> That's very Nathan Lane. You know, and, and you don't even know what the answer is. It's just, he gets a laugh doing it every it's time. Like, it's like a yeah, perfect, I do. like a little <laughs> indignant yes. condescension <laughs> yeah, yeah. at the stupidity of the question. Time. Yeah. Yes. Love it. Oh my God. And again, it doesn't mean he's throwing shade on the question. Oftentimes no. he's like, of course I, I love great. it. Great. He's buying time. <laughs> yeah. 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 To get the zinger. <laughs> Well, I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe we should. I don't know. Maybe we should think about launching a Broadway. Yeah. West you End. Call that, call that British woman. We we gotta gotta call yeah. British that lady. British woman. What kind of pockets does she have? We got to yeah. find yeah. out. Right. Right. I think we had this Brit, Busy, and Liz Banks producing. And Seabiscuit. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> Seabiscuit. Celebrity <laughs> producers. Animatronic Seabiscuit. <laughs> this podcast so. today is brought to you by Seabiscuit. Yeah. <laughs> The puppet Seabiscuit's from War producing, Horse get jealous. Was, yeah, Seabiscuit's producing Equus, I heard, actually, in the West <laughs> yeah. End right now. Of course, you of have course. You so careful with horses on Broadway. They're a competitive market. <laughs> it really is. There's so many of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh. It's about that time. It's about it's about that time to start ordering Christmas presents for people. And <laughs> I'm always just, a fan. <laughs> I'm always a fan of Foria. For, for I was me. just thinking, I hope all of you get Foria in your stocking. It's about that time to buy it for other people. It's also about that time to start dropping hints that you want it from people. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Because, listen, if you haven't heard us talk about Foria before, I don't know where you've been. But if, you, if this is the first time, let's just explain it. Imagine the best orgasm you've ever had in your life, and now imagine that it could be better. That's what Foria wants to do for you. Okay? That's their goal. <laughs> they have products like the Awaken Arousal Oil and the Sex Oil. And honestly, guys, it's a one-two punch to the clit that... <laughs> Am I allowed to say that? I don't know if I was an ad copywriter, if I would write that, but <laughs> I also get what you're saying. <laughs> I don't mean, I mean, it's just like, it really changes the way you experience sex and pleasure and orgasms. Um, you know, because also, I just want to say, uh, so many like products for sex are designed by men for men. Right. With men in mind. Right. And Foria is really designed with people with vaginas and vulvas in mind. Exactly. A lot of products that I've used in the past are like literally uncomfortable. Not even the subject of them being uncomfortable, but like the actual product is uncomfortable. And so the fact that Foria is so light and pleasant and then gets to work doing what it's supposed to do right away, it's just a huge thing. Like it doesn't take me out of the moment, you know? Oh my God. I to Yes, I totally know. The Foria products are all natural. They use like CBD and warming, sensation-inducing organic botanicals that enhance arousal and sensitivity and pleasure, access to orgasm, help with any discomfort. And it's like, you, I'm, sure, I'm sure you're having good sex. Listen, I'm not saying you're not having good sex. I'm just saying that it like really can be better, even better. <laughs> um, we want that for you. I want that for everyone. Foria I think wants that, like, that for you. I think a lot of issues would be solved if people were just coming harder <laughs> and more frequently. <laughs> I'm not I kidding. agree. And don't just take our word for it. It's a huge hit with buyers. You can read the reviews on their website. They are very spicy and very entertaining. I mean, look, we're a fan of the Awaken Arousal Oil and the Sex Oil Uh but they also have the relief, like, for when you have discomfort associated with your period. Right. They have those little suppositories. You can just pop up in there. Yeah. Um, which I have found very helpful. Guys, I'm just saying you should try it out. You should just try it out. You should try it out. You're going to love it. <laughs> we fully endorse you to go ahead, treat yourself to more deeper, fuller pleasure wherever you can find it as often as possible. And you can start with a bottle of Foria. Foria is offering a special deal for our listeners. Get 20% off your first order by visiting foriawellness.com slash best or use code best at the checkout. That's Foria Wellness, F-O-R-I-A wellness.com forward slash best for 20% off your first order. Like we said, we recommend trying the Awaken Arousal Oil and the Sex Oil. You and your partner, or just you, are going to thank us. Element, element, I love you so much. I need those electrolytes replenished so frequently. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a good one? Yeah, I think it's a good one. Busy, I love Element so much that recently I have just been carrying it with me and passing it out to everyone. I gave it out at my clothing sale. I've popped some in envelopes to mail to people that I know so they can try it. I'm a real evangelist for Element. Listen, I also am a real evangelist for Element. I sing the praises. Because, guys, if you're not like a person who um, thinks about electrolytes, like replenishing your electrolytes, let me change that for you right now. Because <laughs> electrolytes control so many different functions in your body. And 
you probably are like, I know, but I'm not a professional athlete. I'm telling you, you can benefit from replenishing your electrolytes. Yeah, like, if you're sweating, if you sweat ever. If you have two glasses of wine the night before. I'm right. not even kidding. You know, like, just walking around, you're losing electrolytes. Sometimes I feel like, ugh, I feel weird today. I'm like woozy. I feel like a little headachey. I don't know what's wrong with me. And then I'm like, oh, electrolytes. I right. got to do that. Right, because they help control functions like nerve impulses, hormonal regulation, nutrient absorption, and fluid balance, which is a huge deal, I think particularly for women. It's a huge deal. And here's why we love Element. It contains a science-backed electrolyte ratio, 1,000 milligrams sodium, 200 milligrams potassium, 60 milligrams magnesium, no junk, no sugar, no coloring, no artificial ingredients, no gluten, no fillers, no BS. (laughs) And... I'm telling you, guys, just try it out. You should just try it out and see if it makes a difference. Element is something that I honestly use every day and I would be lost without it. So I'm happy to have it in my life. And right now, we want you to get it in your life. And Element is offering our listeners a free sample pack with any order. It's eight single serving packets free with any Element order. It's a great way to try all eight flavors. Or you can share Element with a salty friend like I do. I carry them in my purse. Get yours at drinklmnt.com slash best. This deal is only available through our link. You must go to drinklmnt.com slash best. Also, try it totally risk-free. If you don't like it, you can just share it with someone. And Element will give you your money back. No questions asked. So you really have nothing to lose, guys. You really have nothing to lose, and only your electrolytes to gain. Um, so now that you guys have done this this nearly impossible thing, <laughs> and we're all gonna like go see it, guys. Um, now, now, what do you like? What do you do next? Where do you go? Dental hygienist. Yeah, we have a. <laughs> we're going to the dentist every day. You do have beautiful <laughs> teeth. I yeah, will why are your teeth? You're a so shining beautiful. example. Well, I of paid dental a lot health. of money for them. Clank, clank, clank. That's They're the just, sound of me tapping my teeth. They're huge. <gasps> my teeth. When I, you know, you get your adult teeth come in when you're still quite young. Yes. So it's just like a little boy. With whoa, whoa, whoa! Wait, say that toddlers. again. <laughs> just learning this. You're still waiting on some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <gasps> yes. Yeah, um, the, the bigness of your teeth when you're eight years old is, it's real. It's traumatic. It's, it's very traumatic. But also Character what's building. traumatic and like weirdly no one talks about is that like your teeth fall out of your fucking head. Oh my God. It's that's like a, a nightmare, like an actual reoccurring nightmare people have of your teeth falling out and then it just happens to every child. <laughs> every child. They just are like, uh, and then they just uh, hand you a tooth. Yeah. For a while, like a couple months ago, my 10-year-old had a tooth that she had lost and I didn't realize she was like keeping it in her pocket and then she uh, would just put it back on the little spot. <laughs> oh, that's, so man, that's, very that's just awesome. Like, I don't know because she's weird. I don't yeah. know. She sounds like she could produce our West End. She's got a really <laughs> yeah, weird yeah, let's get her. POV. <laughs> oh, my God. She's going to breathe new, like new visionary... <laughs> Life yeah, into exactly. it with that British lady. What what is that gen called? They're not Gen Z. What are they? What are they called? Alpha. Gen Alpha. Alpha. Yeah. She's gonna My older Alpha. daughter though is the last is the last year of. It's the last numbers. child. The they last cut it year. off after her specifically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind She's of. The and then everybody born from there forward is an adult <laughs> in spirit. Yeah. Putting in <laughs> their kind of fair, putting in I their tooth say. with polydent, sticking it, <laughs> sticking yeah. it in. Oh my gosh, that is oh so God. funny. What a- <laughs> I'm not going to be able to stop thinking about Cricket. About her Cricket tooth holding that tooth in her pocket. Finally, I was like, what, the- what is that? What are you <gasps> doing? What's happening? Is Cricket oh. her name? That's a fabulous Cricket. name. I went to elementary school with uh, someone named Cricket. Tell me oh, I love that name. Did you love her, Erin? Yeah, she was really fun. She was oh. like a uh, big tomboy energy in a, in a great way. That's what Cricket has, big tomboy yeah. energy. Yes. Mm-hmm. We've said she's like... Dressed and acted like a 90s skater boy, mm. like, since she was six years old. Yeah. <laughs> it's like her aesthetic is like that. I remember one time, Cricket, we were playing, I guess, kickball, and this kid named Chance 
like really miss. That's the, a fucking show right there. Cricket the and Chance. Cricket and Chance. This kid <laughs> made, named Chance missed a very easy like whatever. And this is like fourth or third grade. And she goes, mm-hmm. come on, Chance, get the stick out of your ass. And we <laughs> died. Di- it stopped. <laughs> we were just dead. You were not allowed to scream that in Texas in third grade. <laughs> Lord, amazing. love Cricket. Iconic. I hope she's okay. well. Okay, well, my Cricket's kind of teeth, like I'm- I hope. <laughs> <laughs> she has so many teeth in her pocket as an adult. That's my Cricket. <laughs> Pocket full of tea. <laughs> Wait, Josh, where are you from? I grew up in North Carolina. Oh, where in North Ooh. Carolina? Little town in the mountains called Morganton. Oh. Tiny little Appalachian town. Okay. Did you go to uh, New York right after graduation? Yeah, I went to the, well, I went to University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and then I set my sights for New York. And there's actually a lot of Chapel Hill people in New York. There's a funny pipeline and a lot of them are in like comedy. It's very interesting. Yeah. Oh, that is interesting. I don't know what that is. Also, School of the Arts is big in North Carolina. So a lot of I them go that. to New York and like try to be on Broadway and are like, wait, improv's better. <laughs> so there's like <laughs> that was, that a whole legion journey. of UCB people. Yeah, exactly. I've, there's a Same lot journey. of those from School of the Arts. Yeah. Um, well, I know Danny McBride went to the School, school of the Arts, North Carolina oh, School yeah. of the Arts. Yeah. So, I and don't know him, but he is so funny. I have a feeling he's going to fucking love this movie. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's going to be right up their alley, those guys. And they're, yeah, they're all North Carolina. That's how they all met. And Um, I love that they've just sort of stayed, that they've, like, sort of moved their little, you know, tiny Hollywood to South Carolina. And they just sort of, like, are based there. That's a great way to do the business. Yeah, he came on the podcast. He's friends with Busy. And he came on the podcast and just talked about how he couldn't bear living in Los Angeles no matter (laughs) what it would mean to his career to yeah. to not be here. And I even like LA, but that is so fab to That's just be cool. like, nah, yeah. y'all are coming to me. <laughs> yeah. 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 And also, LA is fine. <laughs> but it's good to be other places. Yeah, That's yeah. how I feel. That's why we like being in New York. It's fun to go to LA and work and then have a return flight and come back to New York with, you know, all my sad sack picketers. <laughs> I mean, it is. I mean, well, is it over, guys? Is it over? Did it happen? I think they're continuing uh, I've been, like, negotiations. My email. Yeah, to, yeah. As I of think today, the, yeah, it seems to be going well, and they're meeting tomorrow for SAG tomorrow. again. But but seems like progress is being made. You know? Yeah, I just love that they're meeting multiple days in a row because at the beginning, no. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's. It feels like we're on the path, and that the WGA deal happened and is so great. It's like okay, we. I feel like a month ago we were all like, "This will never end," and then now it feels like we've rounded the corner. And we're like, "TikTok, it's going to end any day." Josh now, and you know? I love that. Um, you know, when both unions were on strike and it was like uh, August or whatever, and anyone you'd ask would always just be like, "I'm here in January," and we're like, "From who?" It was very Hollywood brain because they're <laughs> so used to being like, "You have to have an answer." Yeah, I'm here in January. It's like, <laughs> who, 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 who? Really starting this January? <laughs> well, I'm we should talk January. a little bit about for our friends at home who aren't in the entertainment industry about Mm -hmm. like why you guys were able to make this movie and why it can come out and why you can talk about it. Yeah. I mean, we were lucky a couple of weeks ago to get from the Screen Actors Guild, the interim agreement to be able to do promo. And it, as in case you don't know, it's like built on the idea that basically A24 met all of SAG's demands. And so the idea from the union was that by you know, giving these passes for some movies to go into production and some that had been shot pre-strike to do their promo, it was like a great way to show like the asks of the union are completely reasonable. And the fact that a trillion dollar tech company is saying no to them is maybe a choice they've made, yeah, you know? So independent like independent studio can do them, but a little old A24 can, can do it. I know. And then it speaks to just sort of like, or we feel particularly for this movie that it's like, this, they are also the only kind of people who would make a crazy movie like this. It, like it takes those sort of like companies that are like we want to work with artists and take risks on them, and you know, so it, those ideas did feel connected. It, where it was like it's it's not surprising that that type of company is the one that's like I, we will meet the demands of creative peoples. You know, I'm so happy that. A24 uh, rolled the dice on it. And I think like the reason that I love it and I love hearing you guys talk about it is because it seemed like it was just something that you really enjoyed doing when you were doing it. At, that's To me, that seems like probably the secret of your success. It's something that you would have done if nobody cared about it. 
<laughs> and in fact, did do. But that's what I mean. Like, it's not even a hypothetical. Like, we, we did this for a year and a half in the basement of a grocery store for negative money. It keeps right. being called in press an off Broadway show, which is an incredibly generous way to describe the UCB theater. And, and, that was a non equity contract. Yeah, in, inaccurate, in fact. <laughs> yeah. we, we were not so in it, yet. It really was. I, Sorry if I said this already, but people keep asking. They were like, when you were doing the show, were you thinking of it as a movie? And we were like, fuck, no, never. We were just like, we wrote this thing for ourselves and then like found people who liked it. And so I think we feel very lucky that, and that DNA is still very much in the movie. And Larry was very big on preserving that of like, one, that specific sensibility of like, we think this is funny. And if you do too, come in here. But then also just sort of like the handheld, like, feeling like you're in the room with us, like scrappy, crazy. Is the is the train, are the wheels going to fall off? Like he was like very big in keeping that energy alive. And so I think it's fun to see in a movie because those are not choices you would get to make in a movie if you were starting at the point where it was a movie. Right. Like only because it started at this other thing, you're like, that worked in a weird way. How do we translate it, you know? Right. I mean, I can't wait to see. Wait, also though, can we talk about Megan the Stallion? And yeah. in- how the fuck did that happen? I want to know ever. Th- How did that happen? That was another. So that part, she plays our boss and she has a song. But, you know, in, in showbiz, it's very like, oh, OK, this is actually only like two shoot days. So we can get somebody we can take a big swing and try to get maybe like a pop star because they don't have to come on set for the whole shoot. Um, and so they were like, who is like someone that would never say yes? Like, who do you think? And Larry and us. We're like, I mean, Megan Thee Stallion would be amazing, but LOL, she'll never say yes. And they're like, we'll just ask, we'll just ask. And then she did say yes. And when I got the phone call, my husband was in the other room and I was just screaming like, no, oh my God, oh my God. And he thought a family member had died. He no. Was, he was like, babe, what's up? And I was like, oh no, it's actually really good. Uh, but I was just so shocked. Um So that was incredible. And then we had to write that song for her, which was sort of, we had a kind of a placeholder song there. And then when you have Megan Thee Stallion, it's like, well, it's not this anymore. We have to write like a hip hop rap song. So we wrote that. And that was like really exciting working with Marius and Carl. That that, that happened like really fast. And we're so proud of that song. And then she was like amazing on set. She was cool and funny. And like, you know, you don't know with pop stars. It's like, is she going to be a diva? Is she just going to be a nightmare? Whatever. It's worth it to have her in the movie. But she was so, she was like playing tic-tac-toe with the dancers in between takes and like joking and cutting up. And then it's like really fun and funny in the movie. Turns out she's good at her job. (laughs) Turns out she's good at her job. And and it's again, a a level of pop star that you're like, you could be a total nightmare and it'd be worth it to have you. But she's like lovely. Like it was, it was like sort of mind blowing working with her at, at how, talented she is and just like what a good head she has on her shoulders are and you guys, are you guys gonna thing, stay well, friends well we also don't have her phone number and it, every <laughs> day it's like do you, do you text her i'm like i didn't want to give my phone number to megan the stallion are you kidding me i'm not okay. trying i'm not trying to say that i'm closer with her than josh but she is in my apartment right now hanging out <laughs> <laughs> so there's that it's funny she's For like while, i'll just sit course. there while you podcast i don't <laughs> mind she's knitting <laughs> For a while, of course, we were like, I wonder if she'll even remember us. And people were like, you shot a movie with her. She's going to remember you. And we're like, I don't know. And then we went to SNL when she hosted because we have friends there. At the after party, we were like, hi, Megan. And she was like, my boys. And she was like, all week, everybody has been coming up to me and being like, Josh and Aaron are my best friends. Josh and Aaron are my best friends. And I said, bitch, they're my best friends. (laughs) My God, that's the greatest thing. Also, That's- something we I'll die remembering is that because we wrote this song for her and we tried to like put it in a Megan Thee Stallion voice, but it's also like got to be a part of this thing. It's <laughs> not movie. like it's not like it's right. ju- yeah. It's, so it's got the sensibility of the movie still. She 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 raps lines like "Men are scummy sacks of cum," which I would not <laughs> say is like necessarily something Megan is putting in her songs. So she, we were like, for sure, she'll change some of the lyrics or whatever. She didn't. She rapped them all. She just like did it. Then day one shows up on set and was like. You know, people say I'm dirty, but y'all are dirty. (laughs) Wow. Thank you. you. Badge of honor. Thank you. Oh my gosh. What a feeling. God, I love it. Yeah. To be called a dream. All your dreams come true. It was very dreamy come true y. It was very Disney movie. Well, perverted Disney movie. (laughs) Perverted Disney movie. (laughs) Inspired by a Disney movie, and it's like your own Disney movie. Exactly. Oh my God. Cinderella. (laughs) Cinderfella, Cinderfella. Oh, that would have been a great name, actually, for the film. We should have thought about that. Cinderfella. Cinderfellas. That's your next, that's your next film. Yeah, that's yeah. It, without a doubt. Oh Seabiscuit presents Cinderfellas. 
<laughs> I wonder if Seabiscuit managed his money well, if he has the money to get into film Oh, producing. God, doesn't he seem like a mess? Doesn't he seem like he blew it all <laughs> yeah. on Coke? Yeah, he seems I'm like a mess. Honest. Gambling, yeah. right? Come on, like, you he was, like, adding against himself. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah. you gotta know that raised. big, it's gonna take a lot of Coke. You yeah, understand? exactly. <laughs> it's not and, cheap. And ketamine, of course, but that's of ketamine course. for him. That's from the doctor. <laughs> it's a prescription. That's the only... It's the only one that can be doing K. <laughs> yeah. Trashy club rats. They're taking it from the. It's like Ozempic. Let people with diabetes have it. Let the horses have, have their, their K. K. Let them have their K. My God. Sick. Oh, God. That makes me sick. I do feel like. Uh, We're best friends. It's I, Yes, of course. Yeah, me too. We should and, all go to Greece um, together. And then it's like a, it's like a, it's like a good time to, to have a thing to go, um, have a little escapism in the theater and fucking laugh at some stupidity. I think so. I, too. I agree. And again, we've been like getting to go to screenings now at the tell, and it is fun. It reminds you of like the fun of going to the movies when you are like in a packed theater, like all enjoying it together. And it, and it's a type of movie that sort of rewards that of like you know, buy a popcorn, but sneak in a bottle of wine. Like it's very that energy, you know? And so like, I, it's been fun to like watch it with crowds and be like, oh yeah, I, I, I miss this feeling, you yeah. know, of like why movie theaters exist. Oh my gosh. I, I was going to ask what snacks you recommend people buy. You said popcorn oh, and wine. That's a great question. Uh, well, well, you got to get popcorn. It's, <laughs> it's still Lord <laughs> Michaels to recommend popcorn and wine. I feel like that's his favorite snack. Oh, totally. Let me just yeah. say briefly, Larry Charles, our director who we loved, a, a week or two ago was texting us and was like, I think it's important that A24 mar- markets this film as being for truants and deviants. And yeah. we were like, <laughs> he was like, we should that. encourage, we should encourage kids to skip school and smoke cigarettes while they watch the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and we we're like, love that. Absolutely. Screen totally. cap set to A24. <laughs> so now I am making a point of telling everyone like, bye. Popcorn, junior mints, big soda, but sneak in a couple white claws. You gotta be a deviant. You gotta be a deviant. Yeah, that is so funny. Also, Larry Charles, I did no, to... ch- no children smoke cigarettes. They all oh, vape. I love it. They vape. <laughs> they vape. They vape. They vape. I did. You... Someone passed along to me because I'm not really, you know, I'm not going to Twitter and seeing what people think. Someone passed along someone that was like, at the 10 a.m. screening of Dick's the Musical, the guy in front of me who got a glass of Chardonnay with his popcorn was doing it right, turns yeah. out. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> definitely a 10 a.m. morning wine. Definitely kind of a movie. morning wine. And Chardonnay <laughs> is a morning wine. We all know Chardonnay this. Chardonnay is a morning 100. wine. 100. It's juice. It's practically juice. It's, juice. it's practically it's juice. juice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, we always ask you, our guests. We always ask our we guests. We always ask you, our yeah, guests. Yeah, always are asking us that. <laughs> <laughs> we like to ask our guests <laughs> about a pivot that they've taken in life. And obviously, like, I feel like this, the making of this movie was kind of a unforeseen circumstance uh, in the best way. But are there, like, pivots either collectively or individually that you've experienced where you just thought one thing was going to happen and another thing altogether happened well, by choice or by chance? Well- I lived as a straight man for about 20 years. But, <laughs> and I did a pivot and it's played out. That was research for this role, as it turns out. Yeah, so yeah, it actually yeah, it was back. a good, yeah. Yeah, that's um, a pivot. I did, th- I was like a theater kid and thought I was going to be a theater actor and then got into comedy. That And that was, a, I mean, I know that's still performance but it was very different and got really into writing, which is not something, uh, something I always did for fun, but didn't ever, I didn't ever take a writing class or any of, you know, so it was, it was like, oh, I can't really do that. I'm not good enough. And then weirdly the writing like took off before the performance did. Um, so that was a pay that I'm trying to think. of. But you are right that the, the, like this film, which took a long time to get made, did feel like a weird career pivot because for being like dirtbag comedians of that era, like (laughs) always the aspirations were just like, can I, you know, like, land a commercial or get a cable TV show. Right. SNL so being always, like a huge, like yeah. if you could wow if you got on SNL or We always felt like we were lucky to be able to like back ass into film and especially into indie film where, you know, like, so it's like, it's fun to, I think a lot of the sensibility gets to live in TV and so get to put it in, in a movie is fun and, and just like yeah. the joy of making a movie, we've realized is how much you get to like really focus on one story and not like, you all know making TV, it's like you're always doing, you're selling a script and then you're having to convince them to buy a pilot. And then you're making a pilot and you're having to convince them. You're, there's never a point you aren't sort of always thinking about. season and then you know? once season one, oh, please pick us up for season two. You know, so it is awesome. totally. And I think it's why you're able to take these big risks is when they are like, just like you're doing this one thing, you can really like, you know, put a lot into it in a way that like was very gratifying. 
So, yeah, and when you have like a partner like A24, which is just, they just are known for being like a little bit, um, well, um, f- friendly to the creative. Filmmaker friendly. Yeah. Yeah, to the like acknowledging that like what what you're what you're bringing to the table like even if i don't know i mean maybe their executives get it all but maybe the superpower i always think in executives is when they're like i don't really get this but i know it's fucking something i think they're great at that and that's what's been fun about this too because i think they just like haven't made a movie like this which is why they are the ones to make a movie like this like yeah like you'll even see a lot of like classic a24 indie film bros who are like really mad at our movie and they're like why would a24 (laughs) make this they're like they're the only people who would make this that's the whole point like that it's like it doesn't feel like an a24 movie even in a way that i think is very a24 to like make a movie that doesn't feel a24 it's like they 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 have um really nailed that aspect of being like let's take a risk and we don't even have to we we can trust people to make this their crazy movies you know yeah i love that about them i love that they're smart yeah. enough to get out of the way and like let you do what you do and i think just so much is rooted in like making thinking creatively about how to make a movie theatrical like like what is it that yeah. like makes this thing worth going to a fucking movie theater to see in this current like media climate i think yeah. that's like such a cool way to think about making movies you know yeah do you guys think do you guys write together as well like are yeah. you a writing team yeah mm-hmm. it's very same brain we aaron well you, you should say it it's 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 like uh, the friend i say, I say it's yeah. like when you um um <clears throat> when you go shopping with that one friend when you try something on and they're always like, buy it, buy it. We're very like that. <laughs> we're I was like, is this too stupid? And you're like, like no, not stupid no, enough. No. Go for it. We're like always enabling. <laughs> that, our yeah, that, that naughty little enabler. Um, so it's nice having like a devil and a devil on your shoulder. Oh my gosh. I love that. I love that. That's such a good partnership dynamic. Yes. I've worked with people where sometimes you're a team, but it's like you do a pass and I do a pass. You trade back and forth. And we're always like, it's very fun to be, it feels hyper collaborative. We like to be in the same room, like eh, pushing our brains together, you know? Yeah. I love that. I love that for both of you. Aaron, did you think you thought you were going to be like a serious actor? Yeah, I mean, I always was. Um, uh, I, you know, I went to theater school, but I did always get cast in the funny parts and liked that. I wasn't like, Ugh. but you know, a- every now and then you do a drama, but I liked being in comedies and I felt it was my strength. Um, but I did, yeah, I thought I was going to do like plays, you know, and um, and then I moved to New York not that I didn't like everything on Broadway, like there was amazing things, but I was most of it, it's, you know, it's very commercial. It's very, you know, for tourists, most of Broadway. So it was just like, I don't really want to be in this. If this is the top of the ladder, I'm not really interested in climbing that ladder. If I, if I was like going to be, if this is the show I'm going to be in, I'm not, I, it doesn't like inspire me like it did when I was younger. And then, so of course. They, <laughs> then so the then one, you said, improv. Kiss- <laughs> You said kissing Alan Starzynski, though. That's inspirational. <laughs> yeah. I love that, Erin. That's just like Joan Rivers. She aspired to be a serious actress. Right. And then oh my she was God. doing I comedy. Joan Rivers. Yeah, yeah. She was doing you're comedy. Me, I mean, not going to lie, you're giving me Joan vibes. Wow. That's <laughs> I'll huge say it. Phrase. I think Joan would have really liked this film. I I, I'll stake that claim. Too. Well, well, I knew her well, and I think, she, yeah, I think she would have loved it, and I think she would have loved you guys. I feel oh comfortable God. speaking for her. She can haunt me if I'm incorrect. <laughs> yeah, and she, 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 might, she might haunt you if you're correct, even. I feel like she's <laughs> the knows? haunting type. Who knows? Who knows? She's the type. <laughs> uh, we, had a, we had like a, um, a medium on once and uh, talking oh to us God. about like people in our lives or whatever. And she talked to me about Joan, which we, I think Busy asked, like, is Joan there like trying to talk to Casey or whatever? Um, and I was kind of like, well whatever, whatever you believe. But she did say some really specific shit that I was like, ooh, like I really wow. feel like that is Joan. She said some very personal details. It was interesting. That's cool. I mean... She it, was it, like, there's this movie coming out. I'm really excited <laughs> for it. These, and you were like, what? Did you guys release an album? The, <laughs> yeah. The album is out and then they're, um, the, but then they're going to do a vinyl in a couple months. Which oh my so gosh. I can't wait. Are you going to have yeah. a record signing we can come to? Yes. Absolutely. Just for you two. No one <laughs> at, else invited. At Coconuts at Sam yeah. Goody. <laughs> at the yeah, Virgin yeah. Mega Store. We're, we're reopening the Virgin Mega we're Store. We're reopening it, yeah. God, I fucking loved the Virgin Mega Store, guys. Oh, me oh, too. Yeah. Oh, my God. I loved Blockbuster, too. Oh, me uh, too. 
Even my though husband I'm 19, was a blockbuster. I love the Virgin Mega Store. Yeah, even though I'm 19. 19 tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. 19 tomorrow. My husband managed a blockbuster video, and it was very attractive when we were young. When we were in college, I was like, "That's, well, that's, a, that's I, a real I, I man." I applied for my first job to work at Blockbuster and didn't get it, and then I got in the restaurant, and then you know did restaurant work for a thousand years. But what could have been? I could have worked what? in the movies if only I'd worked there. Oh, for a oh second, I thought you meant like the. Blockbuster had a restaurant attached to <laughs> no, it in New York. No. And I was Wait, like, are we reviving this concept? Blockbuster with an in-house restaurant? Hey, that would be now it's kind of like Alamo Draft House, but you rent yeah. a movie and then yeah. maybe you, you have a private sit at a little TV. desk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A little oh, cubicle like, and you watch it. Because well, I don't know. Screwed. I actually fucking think that's no, a great yeah, idea. That's a great <laughs> idea. I'm I would see biscuit on the line. I'm getting sea <laughs> biscuit on the line. We have to do this. <laughs> get sea biscuit to invest. <laughs> I don't know, but like there is something fucking to it a little bit, just because like I get so overwhelmed at the the streaming landscape. I can't. Really I, don't know how to, little... I don't know how to pick a thing. Yeah. And yeah. I love walking into like the horror aisle and just like being scared of the covers. Even though <laughs> I didn't want to, you know, be like, I remember the Silence of the Lambs cover, like being like, that is so fucking scary. <laughs> and you got to go into movies with what Aaron and I would call womb more. That idea when yes. you get to go in knowing nothing, that's so rare now that yes. someone's like, this movie's good. And I'm like, actually, don't tell me anything else. I know. You know like, it's, I'm like, we don't get that as much anymore. So I, I love when you could go in womb. I know nothing. Yes. Yeah. I feel like some things that I'm looking, (laughs) I'm looking forward to seeing are already like people are already on their backlash of it by the time. I know before you, and it's like, it hasn't even opened yet. And there's already like a, like why you have a problem. Yeah. I know when people have, well, whatever, that's very, the internet, isn't it? It really has rewarded having a take, even if there's nothing behind it. It's not possible (laughs) to have formed a take yet, but okay. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. But go for it. (laughs) <laughs> oh, they will. They will go for it. No, they, will. <laughs> they live to go for it. I hope that somebody makes you a blockbuster cover of Dick's the Musical. Oh my God. Uh, that you could just both have on your shelves. I would love, I could browse. Me too. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just to like, just like, just like yeah. a little nice gift for you guys. I, love I hope it. somebody in your life who loves you and is listening to this and maybe represents you, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe finance the film. Or finance the we... film. My, um, <laughs> This is very sweet. My husband, I, I wrote a novel, The Astonishing Life of August Marsh, available wherever books are sold. Um, but it came out during COVID when everybody was in lockdown. Oh. Um, and he he put um, he put it on our bookshelf and put little um, like Barnes and Noble and all the little bookstores I liked by it so I could go look at it in a store. Oh. <laughs> Isn't that the cutest oh, really cute. thing? <laughs> that I said, is okay. I won't divorce you yet. <laughs> that is, that so is really, sweet. really sweet. Aaron. It was really and sweet. Also, <laughs> and also, so like, I don't know. Don't divorce him yet. Don't. I'm not going to. I always say he's definitely the one that's going to divorce me. If it happens. <laughs> I'm just, I'm riding the ride until he tells me it's time to get off. <laughs> what does your husband do? He works for Wirecutter, which is owned by the New York Times, and he tests kitchen equipment and writes. Oh, I'm a big fan of the Wirecutter. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of Wirecutter. I don't make any decisions about things that are coming into my house. Aaron's husband has informed your kitchens. Yeah. You've got, also, you've got some appliances in there. I would oh, say so many he's also ads like, that we have on this podcast, like the items are like approved by Wirecutter. Yeah. That's like uh, critics pick. Yeah. He's mm-hmm. though he's also extremely creative. So like he sews and makes like his own clothes and he um is an, a, a like fabulous cook and throws these like very lavish dinner parties. He oh went Josh goodness. came to one. One time he threw <laughs> This um, is that, incredible. I, I think it was the hundredth anniversary. I can't remember the hundredth yeah, anniversary of the, of the crazy. Titanic sinking. He made the entire like thirteen course meal that was served to the first class passengers the night that the ship. <laughs> Are you fucking kidding me? This is he my daughter's specialty meats like yeah. squab, like things you can't get at the butcher anymore. And then you know? he, oh um, and then we all had a woman like on our plate that was a woman that was on the Titanic with research about her and some of us lived and some of us died. <laughs> if you can believe it, it was a dinner of all gay men. If you can believe that. So, also, I'd say he works for Wirecutter, but what he really does is, you know. Let me, can he I share one last live. detail about that? He did, a, he did a playlist for the dinner, which took like seven hours. And so it was like a lot of like jazz and big band from the time. But then the last, and then it was um, Celine Dion's My Heart Will Go On. And then the last hour was just ocean wave sounds. And that was the playlist. Stop it. For the night. Pretty dark. 
Oh my gosh. And then you I'm all got on your doors obsessed. with your husband. <laughs> yeah, he's a good one. He's a good one. <laughs> Wait, what is he made any friends? Michael. Michael. You sound wonderful, Michael. Yeah, well, Wait, I bet I'm Michael like, would really invite you to over for dinner party. Yes, yeah. nicely. All right. Well, well I like, I mean, I it's going to have York. to have a hell of a theme after that story yeah, you just told us. What is he planning for 2024? <laughs> And it's, uh, it's well, autumnal ask. now, so something with squash. Autumnal. <laughs> something <laughs> squash. <laughs> a patty pan. Or that's a summer squash, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I don't I know. I, I, gotta, I, I have to bone up on my squashes, I have to admit. <laughs> yeah, we keep saying this. Every week we come on the pot and tell you, have you Do boned up on your squash? Have you boned up on your squashes <laughs> Embarrassingly yet? Embarrassingly ignorant of squashes. Oh, it's, my God. I mean, <laughs> ugh. Feels like a My Jeopardy ancestors category. are probably ashamed of me. Yeah. They loved gourds. Well, they lived on <laughs> gourds, I feel like. I feel like I'm oh, descended absolutely. from, they lived from on gourds. gourd survivalists, and I yeah. don't know shit about squashes, but I bet Michael does. Yeah, I bet he does. In fact, I know he does. <laughs> <laughs> he sounds well, amazing. Guys, uh, yeah, um, he's great. You're really delightful humans. Um, not that I'm surprised by that at all. <laughs> and... Uh, and I'm really, really excited to see Dick's the musical. Thank you. Both oh in gosh, theaters we can't and in the West End. On the West End. Yes, exactly. Yeah, on the West End. <clears throat> it's so uh, wonderful to have something to look forward to, like yeah. with <laughs> genuine excitement. And that's how I'm feeling about this movie. So I'm so grateful to you guys and, for accidentally making it. Yeah, me too. <laughs> And two Thank things you. I really love yeah. is popcorn and wine, and they both give me IBS. So I can't <laughs> wait. I can't wait Remember, to watch your movie and then just shit my brains the out. Best time <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then you have all day to get it out of your 10 system. 10 a.m. and then, yeah, you can be on the toilet yeah. the rest of the day. <laughs> I'm excited about it. <laughs> I can't wait. <sighs> You Thank guys you are for just, having us. You guys are just like two rays of two different suns, two, <laughs> two sunshines. Wow. Lynn Manuel and Bomer together at last. <laughs> That could go. Two to the of my end. faves. I mean it as the highest compliment. <laughs> oh, we oh, should yeah. cast them as Cricket and Chase, actually, in that, yes. in oh that my series. God. And take your <laughs> stick out of your ass. <laughs> <laughs> Miranda and Bomer as Cricket and Chase. <laughs> Who's who? Well, we'll have to read them both. I think they'll have to both read, read them both, like, but no, I think yeah, Bomer's do it Chase. I was, oh, yeah, was going to say, the West you guys. End. <laughs> Yeah, West End. L- well, Lynn is obviously cricket. Yeah, Lynn's giving yeah, cricket yeah, energy. Yeah, yeah. We know this. Huge yeah. cricket energy. Yeah. Obviously. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, oh, we okay. know you have so many places to go and so Yeah, I'm sure so you have a bunch of other press. Your movie yeah. with. None as good as this. Come no, on. Oh, okay. uh, well. That's really nice. <laughs> I'm already looking Even forward to you coming true. back next time. Please. Have us on next week after you've watched. We'll just really get into it. <laughs> and we'll really quiz you on gourds. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Do the work. Go see Dick's, the yes. musical movie. Yes. Nationwide, October 20th. And and limited before then. So if you're a coastal elite, see it now. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then see it again on the 20th. And then, it exactly. and then fly to Kansas on the 20th and see it again with <laughs> yeah. real people. <laughs> <laughs> I think you, it's going to be fantastic um, for ever, for the people of Kansas. We wrote this film with just, Kansas in mind, yes. and that should read. That should be apparent. <laughs> <laughs> I am so excited. I've just been having really rough. Oh. Not been very. I don't feel very funny right now, but no, I feel very, like things. I have thought been we tough. were all cutting up. <laughs> yes, okay. Okay. Well, you really well, turned her day around, you know. Oh my gosh. Turned my day around for sure. But I've been, it's been like a weird fucking moment in time. Yeah, yeah. it is a weird moment in time. It's How do you fucking, yeah. I mean, like, this is where I always, I've been doing this, you know, literally since I was a child. And these are like the times when I'm like, How, wait, how the fuck do we promote this comedy when there's like a war and everybody is like, what the fuck? Like, how? And it just feels like it continues to be more and more vital. Mm -hmm. (laughs) that we like are able to go sit and have community with people and laugh over like fucking weird shit. I agree. And also the like cognitive dissonance as artists that it takes for us to like get back into the place of like wanting to when, you know. Oh, I know. 
our rights are being stripped here in mm-hmm. this country. We've been doing some press with Nathan Lane, and yeah. he's incredible. But he keeps saying this thing that's so lovely. And again, like, we're just dirtbag queers doing our stuff. But Nathan when asked, like, why did you do this? He's like, for an older generation of queer like me, we thought very deeply about what other people thought and how we didn't want to make too much noise really and he's like to watch like younger queers who like don't give a fuck what you think in an era where they're that's burning really books sweet. and saying don't say gay he's like that's why i did this movie and we we're like oh my god nathan and it, it, it like made me process that in a way i wasn't thinking about where he's like yeah we should be bold and audacious and make noise you know and that's so amazing. that that is the thing that resonates with me where it's like yeah it is true we should be out there just like doing our crazy shit josh that is fucking nathan. everything it's nathan. really sweet but yeah, it is, I, but it is. It's also true. It's like, what? I mean, what choice do we have except to be exactly. like unapologetically us? And people aren't going to like it, but they weren't going to like me in the first place. So it's exactly. like, I can't be That's bothered right. by that. Exactly. You know? That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I have, yeah, like, yes, we can't, like, you can't try it. That's the thing. It's like, Logic doesn't even exist anymore with these motherfuckers. So, like, trying to assimilate to some idea of, like, what they would find acceptable doesn't matter. Exactly. Because— You can't waste your life on that. Yeah. You can't. It's not for them. It's not for you. It's not for her. You know? Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. (gasps) All right. You guys, I love you. You guys are so sweet and adorable. Thank you. Really, thank you for having us. Oh my God, those guys were so delightful. They really were. I felt like, I felt like I was so, I feel like I was so low energy. I feel like I'm very low energy. (laughs) Well, that's how it is some days, you know? Yeah, it really is. That's so true. So true. Um, But that's okay. I think, you know, they brought a little lightness to the day. Which I so appreciated and so fucking needed. Also... I want to digress for two seconds from the fucking horrors of the universe. Please do. Of um, one of like the costume supervisors from a television show I was on many years ago. I follow on Instagram still to this day, and she's like, "Hey, the posted this like general thing like moms in Los Angeles. Like, if you need help with costumes for your kids for Halloween." Don't forget about your out-of-work TV and film, like, seamstresses and costume teams who would be, like, happy to help, you know. Yes. And Cricket is actually just going with her friends as um, a care bearer for school. Like, Uh, like, just like, you know. Yeah. This bot costume. Yeah. Because they're that, that's the age, that right? Age, like, yeah, yeah. Like, they're like, just, just want something like store bought and like yeah. everybody else. Um, but also for trick or treating, you know what I think would be really funny? It was like a joke that I saw online. Do you watch I Think You Should Leave with Tim Robinson? Oh, I have watched some of it. Yeah. It's insane. And you guys, it's not appropriate for 10 year olds, but <laughs> Cricket loves it. And like, I don't know, somehow it started with Mark and, cricket watching the show together and yeah by the time i like caught on i'm like is this appropriate but then i was like well whatever she's they're in it it's fine yeah and it's so fucking funny i mean it's insane but there is this if you guys have watched the show there's this thing i think it's in the last like whatever the last season was i don't know how many seasons two or three seasons where like it's like a guy's gonna prank people by dressing up as like a really old man and going into a mall and pranking people. Yeah. And he gets all these prosthetics on and like all of this like the heavy like bodysuit and like all these clothes they put on. And then he like gets into the mall and he's like, it's too much fucking stuff. I got too much fucking stuff on. I can't move. I'm freaking out. And he like pa- like freaks out. Like he loses his shit because yeah. he's buried underneath all of this prosthetics. Yeah. I really think it would be funny if Cricket was that guy. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! When I saw like a joke meme, like you know, like how people post those like spirit Halloween like 
packages, but then they just like Photoshop something ridiculous. Right, right. Onto it. Yeah. And so I saw this one and I was like, oh my God, though, but if that were real, that would be honestly so f- hilarious. And I feel oh like Cricket would really love it. And it's so specific. But I don't know how to make that. But anyway, so Birdie <laughs> wants to be Barbie, of course. Of course, sure. And it's she's got, like, the specific outfit that she wants. And sure, I could have found <laughs> it online to buy. I think it exists. But I was like, no. You wanted to I'm gonna do have, it. I'm going to have Jillian make it. So she's she got the pattern. Oh, great. She got a simplicity or McCall's or something, you know, like a dress pattern. She got the pink and white gingham fabric. Oh, my gosh. She's making Bernie this little Barbie dress. Oh, great. I know. I'm so excited. I think it's really sweet. That'll be great. We just bought our Halloween candy. Hopefully, it'll make it to Halloween and no one will eat it all. Oh, shoot. I need to do that. I do need to get candy. But also, yeah, I got to get the decorations out from the storage. Hope there aren't any actual dead mice in there. Right. It's the one-year anniversary of you falling down your front stairs. Today? I mean, roughly, because here's why I know. Because you knocked the pumpkins down. (laughs) (laughs) I actually think it was, I think it was October 20th, is what I actually think. I think it was October 20th. Oh, my God. Um, Things are, things are weird. Um... Yeah, I mean, they're going to be. They're, it's not getting less weird. No. You know? No. Well, it's, you know, it's kind of like those guys, Aaron and Josh, were just saying, you know, about, like, it's really, it's really a time. And it's interesting to sort of just be doing your thing. You know, and and trying to be, well, you were saying it too, trying to be who you are um, and who you were born to be and go forward that way, you know? So, Um, if you can. I had a reading with Chani Nichols. Oh, you did? Mm -hmm. On Friday, actually. Um, And... It was wild. It was like the best. Say? It was literally like the best chart. She I know your, you've been dying to talk to her. I have. Yeah. It, she does. Yeah. So she does your chart reading, you know, and I've had my charts read a bunch by different people over mm-hmm. the many years of my life and interest in star charts. And she had lots to say that was super, like, that was wild and also really specific to me. Yeah. Like, okay, for instance, that in a partner, a romantic partner, she's like, you have to find somebody who will collaborate with you creatively. Like, that's, like, the most important thing based on this thing and this thing and this thing. And I was like, I mean, she could have listened to 4,000 hours of this podcast. I'm sure I've mentioned it at some point, but I don't think she does. It literally felt like, It was like a thought that just was one of many, many thoughts about like where my positions are and stars and fucking whatever, whatever. Um, But I thought that was so wild because I'm like, that is a thing that is so specific. And I'm, I feel very, very strongly about, you know? Well, can Um, I tell you something that's like, this is, I'm not. Chani, Chani, is it Chani or Chani? I'm not uh, an expert in these things. I think it's Chani, but Chani. I have often thought that like the person, the person that I think is going to work for you is someone who takes you seriously in your endeavors and doesn't just think that you're like a flaky puff dreamer. You know what I mean? And I think that that's what, when someone collaborates with you, that's the stamp of approval that someone takes you seriously and thinks that you really can 
like achieve the things that you're like, obviously they, they think it's real enough that they're willing to work on it together. So I'm on board. I agree with that. I have long agreed with that. I agree with it too. And Um, not someone who's prescriptive either, like a true collaborator, not someone who's like, I'm going to teach you how it's done, kid. You know what I mean? Like somebody who's like- Yeah, or you should do this. Right, exactly. Someone who's not trying to advise you, someone who's trying to collaborate with you for real. Um, I love it. Yeah. And that it goes like both ways. Right. That's like actually, I guess, what a collaboration is. Anyway, um, but also she said this thing about like- I'm on the tail end of like a 14-year sort of cycle, Mm -hmm. you know? And so she's like, so we we can like look back 14 years ago and like what are the things that you feel like have really, like the themes and the things that have like sort of really come to being in these last 14 years. And like I certainly – and some of it was like – we had been sort of talking about career stuff. And so I was like, well, it's a career. I don't, I don't know. Like trying to think of stuff. And then I think what it really, what really it has been, and I mean, it's interesting that Birdie's, you know, 15 years old, right? Right. Um, but I think it really has been my, not just like finding my own voice, but realizing that no amount of me trying to conform into someone else's idea of what I should be is ever going to work for any, for anything, not, not in my personal life, not in my work. And the further that I started to like, just absolutely lean into like the most me I could be in these last 14 years, it's like where all the good stuff is, you know? And, you know, and fuck them if they don't like you. We were, I was talking with our friend Ashley and uh, we were talking about other friends of ours who are married and like how much we love their relationship. And Ashley said this thing, I hope she doesn't mind me sharing, but I just thought it was so astute and I think it fits with what you're saying right now is that she loves the lack of judgment in their relationship and like how just not only do they not judge each other's like choices and like I'm I'm not talking about like bad choices like obviously if someone's making like bad or harmful choices like that's something to be addressed. I'm just talking about like day to day in our relationships we judge each other so much for like what we're eating, what we're wearing, how we choose to do a task and like this particular couple just really leans into and loves and appreciates the way that each other does everything. Like, they're like, you're having a tuna sandwich? I love that about you. I love how you love tuna sandwiches. You are wearing mismatched socks? That's adorable. Like, I would (laughs) never try to criticize you for that. You know what I mean? Just like, shit that doesn't matter, they they not only don't hassle each other about it, they love it for each other. And Mm. it just makes their lives so much more pleasant. And I'm like... How do you dial that in? Like, it's just, it seems so basic. But when Ashley said, like, they just don't judge each other, it it seems so basic and, like, also so radical, you know? Yeah. But, like, not to, like, whatever. It's kind of the thing that, like, we all have to do. Yeah. For, for everyone. Yeah. Is to try to, like, move through the world and and particularly when it's a really sensitive scary time yeah with the least amount of judgment in our hearts yeah toward others and toward their reactions and toward how they behave in public <laughs> sometimes you know yeah Well, it's a time for mustering as much love as we can. And like, I think one thing, and I I think you would say this is true about yourself too. Like I have a fucking great memory. And unfortunately, one of the things that I have a great memory for is every time somebody said something that 
wounded me. Like, I can remember back to when I was six and somebody said some thoughtless shit that hurt my six-year-old feelings. And here I am all these decades later and I still can remember it. I still can like bring myself back to that feeling of how I felt. And it's not right. It's not right. People should be more considerate. People should be more thoughtful. But that being said, like I'm choosing in this moment of my life to think more about the shit that I'm saying and who I'm wounding and who, you know, who I, just little things, Mm. like little things when I'm giving my two cents about something that, again, doesn't really fucking matter, especially with my kids. Like, you know what I mean? Like, they're just living Mm -hmm. their lives. If they're doing something that isn't the way that I would do it, but it's also not really hurting someone, I have to let go of that little itch in my brain to say, oh, you know what I would do if they're not asking? Because, like, I don't know. It could be something that really sticks with them. Like, my mom always had fucking something to say about how I was fucking doing something, you know? And I don't want to be that for anyone. I don't want them to remember for the rest of their life the shit that I just had to say about something that wasn't even important. Like, let me save it for when it's meaningful, you know? So, I don't know. I lost track of all my point was. (laughs) I just, I don't... I want to judgment. Yeah. It's about judgment. It's about, it's about letting go of judging other people. Because it's so much easier to love someone when they're just living their life and happy and they can do that better. If I'm like, yeah, girl, eat a peanut butter and onion sandwich. If that's what you want to eat. Like that, like that is hurting no one. I'm not going to act like you're insane for doing that. I'm saying peanut butter and onion sandwich because that was my grandmother's favorite kind of sandwich. And I'm sure I react. It's true. That's not true. That was her favorite sandwich. That's not true. How the? That's not. I know, a but I'm saying like I don't know how she what? came to that. I don't know if her like she had like genetically unique <laughs> taste buds. I don't know if it was a depression thing. I don't know if it was like a prank that her parents pulled on her, and then she just wound up like I don't know. And that, that I never even asked. Thing. I wasn't smart Here's enough. What I, to I mean, ask. that is I. I mean that because we. I would have loved exactly. the story. I'm not gonna lie. Obviously. No, I think, um, you know, for me, I think that's right. Like, I am generally able to, like, hold a great deal of empathy and, like, understanding for especially, like, people I don't know. And then it is harder when it's people that are Mm. in your life. Yeah. 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 For me. Because then it gets personal. And I think some people, and I think some people are the opposite. Yeah, That makes sense. That makes sense. Well, some people just hate anyone that's like outside of their sphere in their life. And, you know, and you're always like, if you got to know that person, you would find some love for them. And that does happen. Sometimes people are like, you know, that's what happens when people are like, oh, when I'm talking about such and such a group that I'm against or whatever, you, even though you're in that group, like you're a good person. You're not like the rest. Of, you know what I mean? Like that happens. That happens. Right. But you're right, tougher totally on people does. in your life. You feel like. Yeah, I feel like that's, my life. That, that's true for me, too. I'm tougher because I'm always encouraging people in my life to, like, see the other side of something or put themselves in someone else's shoes. But it really took me a fucking long time mm-hmm. to put myself in the shoes of the people in my life and see, like, oh, I'm kind of a fucking drag sometimes, you know? Yeah. And I should stop because it would be really easy to stop, you know? Well, it is and it isn't. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, yeah, you're right. It is and it isn't. It's it's a bad habit for sure for me to just be like, oh, you know how I would dry those dishes? Who gives a fuck? Who gives a fuck how I would dry those dishes? Are the dishes getting dried? Then just go do something else. You know? <laughs> then, ma'am, move along. <laughs> move along. No one's being harmed here. It's not worth it. What else did Chani Chani say? What did she say? <laughs> we should really figure it out. I just feel like when I listen to her meditation, she's like, hi, everybody, oh, this okay. is Chani. You're probably right. Wait, I can play it right now. I have it. Wait, let's listen. I never listened to the meditation, um, so of course. 
In case you don't know, this woman is like, I have her app. Hello and welcome. This is the Astrology Week Ahead podcast. I'm your host, Channy. Oh, Channy. <laughs> Jenny Nicholas. Okay, now we know. Now yeah. we know. Um, I always read her name. That's why I was curious about. Okay, wait. I'm going to say it. And then, Josh, can you just edit it in every time? Channy. Channy Nicholas. Um, <laughs> Channy Nicholas. I'm sure Channy understands. She's incredible. Guys, she has got, she's just, she's an astrologer. She's got a, she's got podcast. She does. You can watch her uh, on Instagram. She has an app, an yeah. amazing app. It's like daily horoscope it. things, and I was lucky enough yeah, to get a very in demand chart reading. I know. It's um, really what else exciting. did you say? Anything else interesting? Um, so many things that were interesting, and like, I was really like, I really felt like on a vibrational high, and like really excited and inspired on Friday afternoon and evening, and um. And then I just really feel like I took a hard nosedive with the world world events, and that makes sense. That's that's understandable. War and on Saturday, and I was just like, "What was I even going to do? Yeah. What was my plan?" I don't know. Like I, you know, like I was like, "What did she say?" Did you get what anything? Like, was anything written well, down, or did you take notes or anything? I took some notes, but she also said she would like send me some. Notes, oh, some written out notes cool. if I needed them. I'm gonna I'll, yeah. I'm gonna email her. It's been just, you know, it was just a mi- it was on Friday. Um but I don't know, all the things that like you kind of it was just like was very it was yeah. very affirming about a lot of like work work stuff and where I'm at and like what the future of my work is gonna be sort of you know, tied into, well, like a lot of the stuff we talked about, you you know, we continue to talk about like activism or figuring out how storytelling and what we do can impact and help change people's hearts and minds in ways that are beneficial for moving our culture forward. Well, I'm so happy that it felt yeah. it felt like right on. I got an I got another really energy healing moment because I went to our friend Chelsea Devantes had like an event for her podcast rebrand. It's called Glamorous Trash now. And uh she had like a luncheon, which was really cool, but it had like all these little it had everything. I posted about it on Instagram. There was tacos, there was hamburgers, there was a keynote speaker, there were, but there were swag bags. (laughs) There was this This club had it all. all. And, but there were little activations. You could get a manicure, you could get like an eye look done by a makeup artist, but I chose energy healing, acupressure and Reiki uh, from this practitioner. And I went and obviously I had energy healing done as a generous gift from you um, shortly after my mom passed away. And this time I just went in, like this lady didn't know anything about me. I was just like a party goer. And so she was doing her energy healing thing, which was familiar. And there were many scented oils and things like that. And she, you know how they kind of like move around your body and touch like, you know, touch your leg here, Mm -hmm. touch your foot here, whatever. Um, She... (laughs) At the end of it, like it was all in silence, kind of. There was, she just had like music playing, like background music. She didn't really talk to me throughout it. And then um, after it was over, I sat up and she was like, You know, I usually talk to people as I'm like moving around and doing the energy healing. She was like, But as I was moving around you, all I was getting from you was grief. Like it, like I just felt that you are having like grief that was that was the main message and she said and I just took in a breath to uh say something to you about how mostly what I was feeling was just overwhelming grief and then a butterfly swooped down and flew over you and I was like oh well I don't have to say anything like that 
butterfly, whatever, the grief. And so I was like, oh, yeah, interesting. That makes sense. And I was like, you know, my mom passed away, like, going on a year now, not quite a year now. And she was like, oh, okay. Um, She was like, so maybe that butterfly, you know, maybe that butterfly was your mom visiting you. And I jokingly said, or maybe it was Prince. We don't, and then at that time, the butterfly came back and like flew between us. And I was like, oh, I, maybe it was Prince. Maybe he felt called or whatever. But it was interesting. It was interesting to have her just pick up on grief, like not knowing anything about me. Yeah, because she was fucking quantum entangling with you. <laughs> That's right. That's, That's right. all it is. It literally, little... that is what Reiki and like energy healing is. Right. And the butterfly molecules came. Yeah, it just, it all makes sense. And like, maybe that butterfly was my mom and Prince. Yeah. Or energetically, it was like molecules of your light team that are like swirling around you and like, yeah, just want you to know that you're like safe and held. Yeah. It was interesting. It's interesting. It's so interesting. But I'm, you know, to bring it back to that, like that's something that I subscribe to just about how we're all everything and everything is all us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is, you know, which sounds like hippy dippy, whatever. But also it's kind of, well, it's kind of, deep when you think of like yeah there's like evil in the world and like even that is part of us like but I mean, just by like, it's literally like what kate said yes in that about meditation her. which yeah. is what about her cancer which was like i just was trying to send it so much love yeah because it came from me it's a part of me yeah and it's and, gonna, and it's like killing me but like i want it to know that it's like i'm holding it with love And it's how we, it's similar. It reminded me when you said it before, and now you're reminding me again of how many times we've said, like, these people, we guess they think they're doing the right thing. And the same could be said for cancer thinks it's fucking doing its job. You know, it it thinks it's, it's doing the right thing, even though it could not be more wrong for, for what, for the way that we want the world and our lives to go. And so it's, it's kind of like deep and wild to just think that like, yeah, everything is all of us and all of us are everything. And I sound like I'm on so many mushrooms and I'm not at all right now. I mean, it's, (laughs) yeah, it's definitely like, it's definitely the truth. So we can sound like hippie and like we're on mushrooms, but it is 100% true. Yeah. So there's that. What are you doing your best at this week? Did you say? I didn't say what I was doing my best at this week, but I haven't been sleeping well. So I'm not doing my best at that. I could be better at that. Uh, I just think that I'm trying to stay in touch with people. And that is something that I'm really anxious about. And it's something that I'm never confident that I'm doing the right way. Mm. And it's also something that I know people are very eager to point out to you that you're doing the wrong way. You know, very Mm. often you'll read on social media, like, don't reach out to your friends and say this, don't say this that way. Don't, You know, whatever. And those things, like, I know while they're well-intentioned, like, really do serve to make me more anxious about, like, who I am and how I'm apt to reach out to people. Mm -hmm. I am, like, and I think you'd say this about me, like, I try to give people space when they need space. But sometimes, like, I probably give people too much space and it can read as, like, I don't care about what's going on with them when that is not the case at all. I'm just trying to give people space Mm -hmm. um, so that they don't feel bombarded. But I'm just trying to, like, balance it. I'm trying to balance reaching out to people, remembering to reach out to people that I'm just thinking about. Sometimes I think when we... When we think about someone, we check it off the list. Like, it's a 
mission accomplished. And that's, it. it's good to think about people, but it's also good to let people know that you're thinking about them. But I'm trying to do it in the most right way, even though I know there is no perfect way to do it. And some people, the way that I'm doing it, it won't be right for them. Uh, yeah. And some people will think it's not enough and some people will think it's too much. But all mm-hmm. I can do is, co- is come at it with sincerity and love and really mean it. And so that's just what I'm doing. I'm trying to just be in touch with people in my life and with colleagues or, you know, hopefully future colleagues or whatever, just touching base without being like, a huge pain in the ass or a burden or, you know, it's, it's a real balancing act. It's a real balancing act, but that's what I'm trying to do. You know? Well, I love that. <laughs> I'm, I I'm, that's great. Who knows? Who knows if it's great or, or what, but you know, I'm trying, I'm trying. What are you doing your best at? Okay. I actually think, um, I'm, I do think I'm doing my best at, like, allowing myself to feel all, like, all the things I'm feeling. Um, but then I also, like, recognized and was grateful that I had therapy scheduled. Like, it was getting overwhelming because it's still... You know, like you with your mom as well. Like, grief is a weird animal that is, you know, people want it to be over with, like, immediately or even just in a month (laughs) or, you know, whatever. Yeah. And so it sort of ceases to exist, like, in other people's minds but that you're still in it, right? Like, and, and like my therapist reminded me, I don't remember if I talked about this, but my therapist reminded me a, a while ago, like a couple weeks ago, that everything that I experience right now is all, is like under the veil of, of like a heavy loss and a heavy, deep, deep grief. And so, things hit harder in some ways or feel like more intense or or opposite, like totally detached from it. You know, like there's like all different sort of ways in which I've seen it kind of like manifest in this past like month and a half or, you know? Yeah. But like I think over the weekend when I was just, I was um, Mark had taken cricket for the long weekend away for to visit some friends. So I was like kind of by myself. Yeah. And I was just getting, it was like, uh, it was just fucking too dark. <laughs> it was yeah. just too dark. Like I just got too dark, you know? And I was like, had to pull myself out. Like, so I, I feel like I was doing my best at like pulling myself out by like reminding myself that, I mean, it, f- experiencing the grief of war and like the, you know, all of that stuff is obviously like very valid and like to feel the things, you know, and in, in, is important, but like also to not, like, I, to, re- to be able to recognize when it's, it becomes like crosses over into a different place. Do you know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. Yeah. I totally know what you mean. I totally know. Well, because it'd be, you know, and this is no shame to anyone who's ever experienced this because I'm saying it would be easy to get pulled under to just let, this is something that happened with my mom a lot, to be honest. And so I'm speaking from like the perspective of a kid My mom very often allowed herself to be absolutely pulled underwater by feelings. Mm. And it was really hard to be that person's kid. You know, it was really hard to feel like I had to pull her out of whatever it was that, and it could 
could have been anything. It wasn't just war. It was like anniversaries of things and, you know, uh, just whatever, you know, just a reaction to something that happened in life. And it was really hard to feel responsible as like a little kid to be like, I have to get her out of this. I have to get her out of this for our like life to go on, you know? And Mm -hmm. like when you're a little kid, I'm just thinking of like to get a ride to school, I have to get her to feel better. You know what I mean? And it was, it was a big job. It was a big fucking job. And I think that's a place where I can see in my life I've been as an adult in, you know, all throughout stages in my life. And my kids have probably felt that way or people in my life have probably felt that way. So I know how easy it can be to get pulled under. And sometimes I'm getting pulled under by things that are like, well, it's so weird, right? We've talked about like not comparing reactions or whatever. I think I've been sadder sometimes about things that have happened in other people's lives than they have been sad themselves to be living through it. You know what Mm. I mean? Like people that I've known, like there, there have been friends that have like split up. And I think I've cried more over like the dissolution of their relationship than maybe they have, you know what I mean? Which is weird. But then also I'm like, well, obviously like, um, I'm putting my own feelings about what this means. Uh, you know, I'm I'm bringing like prior experience to this that has nothing to do with them to like my feelings about it. So right. I just know right, and how, that's like kind of the that's like kind of what all people do, right? Right. Which is like yeah. what yeah, like what I'm saying. Which is like there's sometimes like there's a, especially when you're in like deep grief or whatever. Yeah, there's a thing. And you, there's an appropriate response to that, a reaction to that thing. And it might even be like a very extreme reaction right. and response to that thing. Right. But then when you put, well, like in my case right now, it's like this loss and grief right. on top of it. But, it. but it also could be clinical depression or like, right. you know, an- severe anxiety or just anxiety at all or, you know, whatever. I mean, being a new mom, all... Everybody has all of these different, like, things. These, like... Yeah, this unknowable pattern. That, unknowable. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's really... I think it's really smart and mature of you to be like, this is a place that I have to pull it back from because that's not always the easiest thing in the world to do. And I haven't always been able to do it. So I admire so much that, you know... I really did. I really had to. I really had to. I really had to. Um yeah. And then I had to process some stuff too. Like, and you know, and part of it, like we we talk so publicly, like publicly, this is a podcast. But like we talk, you know, we talk so w- about our like our thoughts and our feelings and our views on all kinds of things, you know. And what I and this happened a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago with something else with you and me on the podcast, where I was like, I actually can't talk about that because I actually can't say for certain that I'm going to be able to talk about it with the with clarity because of my own grief that right. is clouding everything that I everything that is right. happening and I see right. you know and whether it's like a collective thing that we all are experiencing or if it's just specific to me you know but I think that being aware of that has been really fucking helpful yeah because Especially in the last, yeah, I mean, it was helpful a few weeks ago when I, you know, when I talked to you about it. Yeah. Like, I, (sighs) and I think it's important to remember that it's okay. It's okay to not be able to, like, listen, we're in a place where we've never been before. So to expect any of us to speak with any type of expertise. Yeah, any type of certainty is yeah. it's but can I just say one thing though? You can say anything. And I really gotta go because I have to do that other podcast. But <laughs> maybe I don't maybe we can't get into this. What what do you want to say? Dax Shepard. <laughs> we love you. Because here's what I don't JVN. like. Like I'm all about asking because what I was about to say is like I think it's okay to ask questions. Mm-hmm. I think it's okay to not have the answers. What I don't think is okay is to couch 
things as genuine questions when you've already made up your mind. Yeah. Yeah. When you have like a solid opinion and you, it's, it's and also they're of, bullshit questions. Well, it's cowardly not to just well, say here's what I think, not, you know. They're not questions. What? I said they're not questions. I don't know. That whole thing was a mess. I just think like <laughs> In any situation, if someone's telling you that they're almost crying because of something that you're saying, stop. You know, <laughs> like, just stop. That's all That's all you have to do in that situation. Like, if you're hurting someone and they're almost crying, just stop. It doesn't matter what the conversation is about. Anyway, I love JVN. I think they're great. Uh, yeah, and... I was happy for the the show of support that people made for uh, JVN in that situation. But yeah, we never even really got to talk about it. But like literally, like that was like just a week ago. I know. It seems like months ago. It seems like it happened in, yeah. in months ago. And it's a bummer. It was really weird. It was, yeah. It The whole thing was really... It was just unnecessary and it's it's disappointing, you know? That's it's disappointing. Again, I holding space for anyone to fuck up or whatever, but I just feel like when you're when you're stepping on someone like that and they're like moved to tears and like I I'm not saying like you know obviously we've seen crocodile tears in the past but when someone's like moved to genuine tears because of how upset something is making them just stop like <laughs> listen to them just hear them hear them I don't know what a fucking mess what a uh, mess it's all tied together somehow guys you figure it out and get back to us <laughs> let us know wait what's the podcast you're going on quantum entanglement guys quantum entanglement <laughs> Amy Poehler's and Amy Poehler and uh, Liz Kakowski have that like new podcast that's like improv. They give you like the scenarios. It's just totally, it's just improv though. Got it, got it, got it. I didn't, I don't come from improv, guys. <laughs> I don't fucking know. Like I said, some of my least favorite people taught improv. Oh my God. Hilarious. Hilarious. I'm doing the next one that they haven't announced yet. They must not have announced it because. I don't know. Or maybe they have. I guys, I don't read I don't read you know. I don't know. I don't know what it's I'm just, about to do. You're doing a podcast that will will be able to say what it's about at a later date. But that And I know shouldn't. that I get to have a little bit of fun with Ike Barinholtz, my good friend Ike Barinholtz. Oh, great. So we'll look out so for it. It'll that. be coming in the future. And yeah. Yeah. That's exciting. All right. I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> all right everybody thanks for listening to us we hope you go see dicks the movie musical and um we're sending all of you love we love you so much love and we'll talk to you very soon we'll talk to you so soon <laughs> bye, bye. Oh, no. <laughs>